Over the past few years, we've seen some truly impressive creations come out of the ROM hacking scene. Whether you wish to force feed Sonic the Hedgehog onion rings till he can no longer move, experience Mega Man 2 through the eyes of the angry video game nerd, or simply remix a game that you've played a million times, there's surely more hacks out there than any sane person has the time for. To tell you the truth, I really don't have much interest in those types of hacks. Sure, they're novel, but in most cases, I get really bored very quick. On the flip side, I found myself more invested in hacks that have more utilitarian purpose. You know, hacks that incorporated updated features, or optimized certain aspects to make a game more playable, or in some cases, more tolerable. Oftentimes, these sorts of hacks are pushed to the wayside because they aren't exactly flashy, controversial, or ridiculous. So, I thought it would be fun to shine a light on some of the more useful hacks that I've discovered, and I think they're well worth checking out. Game hacks are hugely popular these days. Sites like romhacking.net add content daily. But not all of it is what I consider good. In my quest to find hacks that skew closer to a game's original vision, I'm sure that I'll miss plenty of really good original efforts, but hopefully I'll be able to show you something that interests you. For all intents and purposes, the cartridge hacks featured in this episode should be playable on original hardware using a flash cart like an EverDrive or via jailbroken firmware on the analog FPGA consoles. Cartridge-based game hacks are designed to be applied to ROMs using an IPS patcher, such as Lunar IPS. CD-based consoles will need to be modified so they can play burned backup discs, or with an optical drive emulator. Games on disc media are much bigger and more complex, so they're usually more difficult to deal with and use a variety of different patchers. I'm not going to be really getting into the nitty gritty of applying these patches, so if you see something here that interests you, you might have to put in some additional legwork of your own to get them up and running. Granted, you might be able to find pre-hacked versions if you don't want to get into all that stuff, but it's up to you to find them. When a game makes the jump from one region to another, many times there's a laundry list of changes that comes along with it. But one of the coolest things about a ROM hack is that we're able to compile those changes, take notes, and build a perceived best version of the game. From graphics, to sound, to difficulty, and beyond. This was especially true when it came to Nintendo games, who were famous for removing imagery that they perceived as controversial in the West. Some of the more obvious examples of this are in the Castlevania games, where crosses and other religious iconography were tweaked or omitted completely. These kind of restoration hacks are pretty commonplace on the NES, with many of them existing solely to put these minor tweaks back in. Gargoyles Quest 2 had a number of demonic references removed. But that's not to say that Nintendo was the only one to dole out this type of censorship. In Streets of Rage 2 on the Genesis, there were a few extremely minor graphical changes made to various animations and other details. Despite being barely noticeable, these alterations were reinstated in a decensored restoration. Color restorations are kind of an expansion on this overall idea. These hacks are all about tweaking a game's color usage to match closer to the source material. Many times this is completely inconsequential, but people might prefer them nonetheless. Ghostbusters on the Genesis has a hack that does nothing more than make the uniform colors tan instead of white in an effort to make it look closer to the source material. Revenge of Shinobi's restoration is equally insignificant, making the Spider-Man and Batman bosses the color of their comic book counterparts. Castlevania Harmony of Dissonance on the Game Boy Advance has a hack that gets rid of the blue glow around just Belmont. This originally served the purpose to make it easier to track him on a system without a lit screen, but it looks so much better without it. Many of the best color restorations have been done by a hacker named Gabriel Pyron, who has produced a number of very cool color hacks for the Genesis and Sega CD. One of my favorites is the Golden Axe color restoration, which has a less contrasty, more faded look to it. Although unfortunately, it doesn't make Gilius Thunderhead's axe gold like the arcade game. 
Of course, this is just a mere sampling of Pyron's work. A number of other standouts, like Final Fight CD, which has skin color, clothing, and background colors altered to look more natural and accurate to the coin-op original. While we're on the subject of graphical tweaks, PlayStation fans who have the ability to play backups of their games should check out the D-Dither patcher for games on the system. Dithering is the use of alternating patterns, such as lines or checkerboards, in an attempt to simulate more colors than a game or console is capable of displaying at one time, and is especially common on early 3D consoles. The method for hacking out dithering in PlayStation games was discovered by Chris Covell, and Schmucks.com forum user Crazy Manzer created an extremely easy to use brute force patcher for it. All you have to do is drop a PS1 disk image file into the .bat file and it'll generate a patched version. Probably the biggest jump in quality comes from Castlevania Chronicles, which is a port of the X68000 reimagining of the first game. Normally, the PlayStation 1 absolutely butchers the artwork of the game by applying heavy dithering across everything. Removing the dithering makes a world of difference and almost makes it feel like a brand new game. Strider 2 selectively adds dithering from area to area. It's out of control in the iceberg base section, especially in the background. Some games already have the dithering baked into the graphics, which can give the impression of looking virtually unchanged after being patched. However, the trade-off for removing dither is that the PlayStation will render shading as strong bands of color instead. As such, de-dithering is at its best when it's used on games that make heavy use of 2D elements. Final Fantasy Tactics' use of dithering is fine for the 3D portions, but the checkerboard pattern across all the characters is pretty ugly. Removing the dither here fixes that, and the 3D elements don't suffer at all. So your mileage may vary from game to game. You'll just have to try the patch and choose dithering or no dithering to see what you prefer. If you're curious to learn more about dithering and how it's used on the PlayStation 1, Displaced Gamers on YouTube has an excellent video on the subject that is well worth checking out. Fixing up or restoring audio is a whole other subgenre of ROM hack that doesn't get a lot of appreciation. Perhaps it's because it's really difficult to show the difference. You've really got to have an idea of what was wrong with the sound in the first place. Although we didn't get the FM sound add-on module for the Master System here in North America, many games have the coding still on the cart if you have the hardware to be able to take advantage of it, such as the Powerbase Mini FM or a mod. There's a couple of notable instances where the code for the FM audio was removed. Fantasy Star and Wise. I mean, Ease, the Vanished Omens. I've talked at length about the former, but the FM sound restoration for Ease brings that soundtrack back into the fold. While I don't always love FM music renditions on the Master System, this is one of the few where I'd prefer to play with it on. There are a number of musical alterations in Xanak on the NES when it was brought to the US. The general consensus seems to be that the Japanese Famicom version is slightly better. A music restoration hack puts the Famicom music into the US version of the game. Back in 2014, a ROM hacker named Rain Warrior noticed some issues with the overworld and ending music in Star Tropics on the NES. Certain notes were glitched, throwing off the timing of different layers of the mix. Through a simple hack, we're now able to hear the music as it was originally composed. Music restoration hacks are especially prevalent on the Game Boy Advance, where ports of SNES games suffered badly. Since the Game Boy Advance doesn't have dedicated sound hardware, these restorations still have that signature fuzzy GBA sound and don't quite sound perfectly accurate to the originals. But I'd say that it's a nice improvement. Breath of Fire had a sound restoration that I felt was much nicer sounding than the original Game Boy Advance music.
Breath of Fire 2, and several of the Final Fantasy ports receive similar treatment, but it's hard to say if they truly sound better or not. Undub is the practice of reinstating the original Japanese voiceover into a game where the English dub just isn't cutting it. While I felt that it was more of an endearing quality and fit the atmosphere of the game, a lot of people absolutely despise the English dub and Grandia on the PlayStation 1. The Undub is for those people in particular, which restores the original Japanese voices both in and out of battle. <laughs> Try has spent a lot of time singing the praises of Ninja Ryukenden 3 on the Famicom, better known as Ninja Gaiden 3, the ancient ship of doom here in North America. As we know, the US version famously upped the difficulty, not only by adding more enemies and making Ryu's defenses paper thin, but also removing the infinite continue system that was a mainstay of the series, as well as the Japanese version's new password feature. It's speculated that changes such as this were implemented in an effort to combat the video game rental market, but it could also turn a great game into an exercise in frustration. The Ninja Gaiden 3 Restored hack revives the deleted passwords and continue system, and ups Ryu's defense to align with the Japanese version, all while keeping the enemy placement of the US version. So while it's not a complete restoration of the Japanese version's material, it's better to view it as more of an ultimate version of the American release. Contra Hardcore on the Genesis was another game that saw a steep difficulty increase in localization. While the US version might be the toughest game in the series outside of Shattered Soldier, the Japanese version is a bit more lenient. Instead of the series staple of one-hit deaths, the Mega Drive version gives you three hit points per life, allowing some wiggle room before you lose your equipped weapon. The hit point restoration hack imports the system into the North American version of the game. Thankfully, this doesn't break the game, it just evens the odds for those struggling with the difficulty. While not as severe, even Contra 3 on the Super NES had some difficulty modifiers incorporated into the US version to make it tougher, although nothing was quite as extreme as hardcore. The Contra 3 restoration not only gives you back the unlimited continues of the Japanese version, but also the cheat codes, one of which allows for 30 lives. When returning to older generations, you'll often hear people say that a game hasn't aged well without taking into account the time period it was made in and the limitations that came with it. While I generally don't have a problem adjusting to some of the more antiquated features of older games, there's definitely times when I found myself wishing for certain minor quality of life improvements or optimizations. Alex Kid in Miracle World mapped the jump and attack buttons opposite to what we're accustomed to. The reverse controls hack does nothing more than assign the buttons as they should be, making it feel more natural. The action platforming of the early Castlevania game certainly taught some valuable lessons to those who grew up with them. The first and foremost of which was committing to your jump, because there was no turning back. Well, that is, until now. The improved controls hack for Castlevania 1 and 3 give you that freedom to angle or turn back mid-jump, and to have a tiny bit of control after taking a hit. This might betray some of the core challenges of these early games, but some might find it makes them infinitely more playable now. Earthbound has a rudimentary hack that assigns menial tasks to buttons so you don't have to click through several layers of your menu. Now if you want to talk to someone, you just walk up to them and press A. One of my favorite quality of life hacks is the integration of a save system, so that you can resume your progress later on. I realize that something like this might seem silly for people who use emulators armed with save states, but for people like myself who prefer to play on real hardware whenever possible, I think it's pretty great. Call me weak or whatever, but I always thought that Super Mario 3 was way too long if you didn't use warp whistles. So a save feature is something that I welcome openly. 
The battery hack will save your game after each level, letting you resume whenever you feel like. There's no real interface for the game saves, it just works in the background. If you want to start from the beginning, just select Erase at the title screen. The Master System has a number of great games that benefit from the addition of a save hack. Spellcaster, an action game with some graphical adventure segments, is fairly lengthy and has a 24 character password that was especially tough to uh, remember when you had to write it down. A save hack lets you load from the last time you called down a password from the heavens. Compiles Govelius has a password style system consisting of 32 characters you have to input. This save hack automatically generates a save every time you visit Winkle, who is placed around the map in various caves. Finally, for the Wonder Boy 3 fans out there, the Master System version has a SRAM hack that allows you to continue from the last time you stopped in to see the Eyepatch Pig. Although influential, the original Metroid doesn't exactly sit high on my replay list. Sure, it's pretty cool to see the beginnings of the series, but the quality of life additions of the sequels make it kind of hard to go back to the original. If only we could take the luxuries of Metroid 2 and Super Metroid and retrofit them for the first game. The Metroid Plus Saving Hack gives you the ability to save your game instead of writing down a massive password each time you're ready to call it a day. At the bare minimum, this sounds enticing, but the way these save files are presented feels incredibly natural and authentic. Whenever you die, you'll be given the option to save your game, which is nice, but remember that you'll always be revived with just 30 health and completely drained energy tanks, same as the original. However, you can preserve your current energy by saving manually. To do so, just pause your game and press up and A on the second controller. I just wish there was a slightly different implementation, because this isn't exactly convenient. An equally, if not more important addition to this hack is the mini-map that appears when you press start. I've always felt that the original Metroid is much harder to find your way through because of how rooms tend to repeat and how vertical shafts go on forever. This does a lot to alleviate getting lost and setting a destination, but don't expect a Super Metroid level of integration. You're given the entire map of Planet Zebus right off the bat. And it's pretty small on the screen, meaning that you'll have to do a lot of scrolling if you want to plan out a specific route to explore. To top it off, it's not filled in or colored differently to show where you've been already which might limit its overall usefulness. That's not to say that all these hacks have to have some grand mission statement. Sometimes it's tiny additions and tweaks that make for a more interesting experience, which might be a good way to replace some old favorites. Rise from your grave. For instance, myself and a handful of Altered Beast fans out there might think it's fun to play the Genesis version with the arcade voices hacked in. Power up. Maybe you just wanted Lightning Force to be called by its real name, Thunder Force 4. Chris Covell's work in progress conversion to the TurboGrafx-16 version of R-Type to the more powerful Super Graphics hardware is pretty cool to see. It gets rid of the slowdown, sprite flicker, and increases the vertical resolution. Although it currently only works up until level four, I'm excited to see this get completed one day. Let's face it, no discussion about ROM hacking would be complete without fan translations. When the community surrounding a game comes together, great things happen and many of these localizations are proof of that. Although it received a full English release, the Mega Man 7 restoration has a completely new fan translation, while also reincorporating minor cut content from the US version, such as post-boss conversations with auto or roll. Although the translation isn't exactly wonderful, with several grammar mistakes, Mega Man fans will undoubtedly see a lot of value here. To a much greater extent, Dynamite Heady had its story elements almost completely gutted and a bunch of specific graphical and difficulty elements adjusted. A delocalization corrects this, and has all the story elements fully translated into English. In the Japanese version, you also start with two continues, a welcome reprieve in this deceptively difficult game. A 
Assault Suit Vulcan, or as we know it in the USA, Cybernator, is a complete fan translation which restores all kinds of stuff, such as character portraits and missing story elements. Doremi Fantasy was one of the great SNES platformers that never released in the West. When it was released on the Wii Virtual Console, it was kind of a big deal. But as was typical of most imports on the VC, it was left completely untranslated, which might make the game's progression confusing for newcomers who may not know that they need to collect certain items in every level. A fan translation for a game like this is almost a given, considering the minimal amount of text here. And then, there's the RPGs. The RPG fan community has worked tirelessly since the early days of ROM hacking. Chances are, if a game is pretty decent, there's going to be a fan translation for it. Although it's probably obvious, the Super Nintendo has the greatest wealth of fan translated projects, mainly due to the output of quality titles by Enix and Squaresoft in particular. My first experiences with Final Fantasy V and Seiken Densetsu 3 came from these sorts of projects. And while these both finally have official translations, there's an absolute ton of great games that still have never been localized. Chief among these are Bahamut Lagoon and Treasure of the Rudras. Both are late-gen Super Famicom releases that we somehow missed out on, with Square choosing to localize Capcom's Breath of Fire instead. Speaking of which, the Breath of Fire 2 retranslation project is a must for anyone who suffered through one of the worst official translations that I can think of. In fact, this is much more than just a retranslation. It adds all kinds of new AV elements, like a new opening and text box. Although, I do wish you could turn off that status screen background, though. Ease fans should check out EN Genesis' translation of Ease 5, Kefin, Lost Kingdom of Sand. This Super Famicom exclusive entry is the only year of Adol's journeys that still have no Western release of any kind, which sort of makes it a must play, despite not being all that well regarded in the series as a whole. On the PC Engine Super CD-ROM, Ease 4, Dawn of Ease, received an absolutely incredible fan translation that went as far as getting voice actors to dub the cutscenes. Dogie! Dogie, is that you? And that's... Adol! Hey, boss! Although Ease, Memories of Salsetta may have rendered the story in this release obsolete, the effort here should not be ignored. It's still well worth checking out for fans who enjoy the bump-style gameplay of Ease 1 and 2. Even the Sega Saturn has been getting in on the fan translation action lately. Although we were lucky to get Shining Force 3 as a Saturn was on its deathbed here in the US, the sad fact is, is that it's a woefully incomplete story. In Japan, there were two scenarios that followed up on and fleshed out the story and world. Both of these have since then been fully translated to English. The newest Saturn fan translation release is Linkle Liver Story, an action RPG that was Next Tech's follow-up to their 16-bit Zelda-like Crusader of Senti. Unfortunately, there just doesn't seem to be nearly as many fan translations for CD-based games in general. On PlayStation 1, the best effort that I've come across is Fantasian Productions' translation of the Tales of Fantasia remake. This is generally considered to be the definitive version of the game, with added content, animated cutscenes, and more. There's a decent number of Japanese games that were fully localized to English and released in PAL territories, but not in North America. Thankfully, many of these official translations have been patched for 60Hz playback on NTSC consoles. Of these, the one that I'd say that you've got to play is Terra Enigma, which along with Soul Blazer and Illusion of Gaia, make up Quintet's legendary Gaia Trilogy. What a travesty it was that this game was never brought to North America, but at least it was fully translated to English for a PAL release. This is, without a doubt, one of the top five Super NES games that we missed out on. The other big one is Treasure's Boss Rush Run and Gun Alien Soldier which was long considered one of the most impressive games on the Mega Drive, with huge sprites and tons of action on screen. In the US, Alien Soldier was only released on the Sega Channel service originally, but has made appearances in various collections since. But if you want to play on original hardware, you can instead play a 60Hz patched version of the PAL release. Sometimes, 
something a bit more extreme is warranted. Some hacks go all the way, combining different facets of restorations, delocalizations, and quality of life hacks to give a game a more thorough makeover. Now, I'm an unabashed fan of Working Designs, the game publisher responsible for localizing a number of relatively obscure Japanese titles for systems like the TurboGrafx-16, Sega CD, and Sega Saturn. But for all the interesting things that they did before shutting down in 2005, their translations and their tweaking of various aspects of games that they published is, well, pretty divisive to put it lightly. Muttonhead? He's the one who broke the black COP brain! From 90s pop culture humor to upping the difficulty in extreme ways, there's a large contingent of people out there that absolutely loathe what they did to certain games. Enter the Unworked Designs. These hacks were created by romhacking.net forum user Supper and undoes most of the changes by working designs and reverts them back to their Japanese counterparts, except for their signature translations. These restoration hacks are available for a range of releases, from the TurboGrafx-16 CD to the PlayStation 1. Each game-specific download includes the necessary pieces to patch a disk image either automatically or manually. However, I'm going to be honest here. It took a lot of trial and error to get most of these to work right. Depending on how your disk image is ripped, things might not go so smoothly. Some games were more heavily altered by working designs than you may have realized. The most heavily affected were both Lunar the Silver Star and its sequel, Lunar Eternal Blue. While the first game increased the stats of some bosses, the second game buffs all enemies across the board significantly and makes the game pretty challenging. Returning these factors to normal make things a lot more fun, but not too easy. But the biggest change is one that I think that everyone who has ever played the Sega CD version of Lunar 2 can agree on being awful. And that's the use of having to spend magic points to save your game. Why this decision was made is beyond me, and combined with the increased difficulty, makes the game exceptionally grueling in the early parts. The unworked design patch reverts these tweaks, but not all changes to these games were underneath the hood. You probably noticed the use of uppercase and lowercase letters in the patched version, which is much more aesthetically pleasing than the all-caps screaming of the originals. In addition, some previously censored content has been restored, but I must say that there is one particular disappointment for me with this version of Lunar 2, and that's the removal of the Star Dragon Tower music, which in my opinion remains one of the best final dungeon themes of all time. I'll gladly take the loss of that track as a trade-off for the save and difficulty restoration. Working Design's other Sega CD games, Vi and Popful Mail, don't have quite as elaborate unworkings, but are nonetheless worth checking out. Both games have restored enemy and character stats, in addition to bringing item costs back in line with their Japanese counterparts. Popful Mail in particular becomes much easier as a result, which might not be to everyone's liking, but I think it's a bit more fun and breezy this way. Cosmic Fantasy II, Exile, and Exile Wicked Phenomenon on the TurboGrafx-16 CD had some censored content restored and enemy health brought back to match their Japanese versions. However, this is where I ran into the biggest snag. I couldn't apply these patches to my disc images no matter what I tried. Hey, at least it doesn't seem like we missed out on too much with these. Even some of their 32-bit releases were given the unworked designs treatment. Magic Knight Ray Earth on the Saturn has enemy stats and speed restored. Both Lunar Complete games also have many changes compared to their Japanese releases, but much less work was needed to restore them compared to these Sega CD games. Most of it comes down to stats and money tweaks. As of the time of this video, there's been very little progress on the project in the past two years, so it's hard to say whether or not these will ever be completely finished. Perhaps someone can pick up and carry the torch, because I'm sure there's a decent number of people out there who would like to see the PS1 version of Silhouette Mirage get unworked. When the Game Boy Color released in 1998, one of the most exciting early releases was The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening DX, an enhanced version of the black and white Game Boy Classic, now featuring excellent use of color. While Nintendo would go on to colorize a handful of other Game Boy games with GBC-specific features, it never really became a major trend. 
This is one area where the ROM hacking community has been able to step in and give us what Nintendo never did. A popular more recent Game Boy Color update is the Super Mario Land DX patch by Torres. This is much more than a basic colorization, with many of the sprites and backgrounds having been updated to mesh better with a fully colored world. Extra flourishes, like gradients, use the Game Boy Color hardware in a way that makes Super Mario Land look almost a step beyond what you'd expect from an 8-bit game. However, the most notable drawback is that this very ambitious coat of new paint does seem to strain the hardware a bit, and scrolling is oftentimes not as smooth as the original version. Some might not even notice this choppiness, but it's also present in Taurus's popular Super Mario Land 2 DX patch, which was actually released first. Super Ghouls and Ghosts on the SNES was a flawed but decent follow-up to Ghouls and Ghosts. The biggest problem by far was the extreme slowdown which cropped up at even the slightest bit of stress on the system. For many people, this did irreparable damage to the series' name and reputation. It was discovered years later that it actually stemmed from a programming error buried deep within the code. Decades after its release, the Super Ghouls and Ghosts restoration hack patches this bit of errant code that causes the slowdown while also bringing back the censored demonic names and religious imagery. The difference can be felt from early in the first stage, making this pretty much the ultimate version and may do a lot to repair your views on the game. I still think that Ghouls and Ghosts on the Genesis is way better though. Anyway, does this mean that the slowdown in a lot of the early Super NES games were due to a programming error? No, no. Let's not kid ourselves, slowdown in the system was a very real problem. But one Brazilian ROM hacker is going to great extents to fix this in some of the early Super NES games. One of the more interesting projects that has got a lot of attention this past year is Vitor Vilela's Gradius 3 SA1 hack, which applies Nintendo's enhancement chip that was used in games like Kirby Superstar and Super Mario RPG to offload the heavy lifting from the SNES's CPU. The results are incredibly impressive. Even the slightest hint of slowdown is gone. Most obviously when the screen fills up with bubbles on level 2. Since the slowdown gives you more reaction time, chances are that this version of the game is going to be significantly more difficult for most players. Diehard fans, though, they're going to eat this up and have probably already been playing it since its release. A much less talked about SA1 conversion that Vitor has been working on is for Super Mario World. You're probably thinking, what? Why? And yeah, improvements aren't nearly as apparent here, but when you really start looking for slowdown in Mario World, you might be surprised how often you find it. I've never noticed it, and now that it's been pointed out, I'm not sure if I'll ever be able to unsee it. I never knew that something as simple as the circle out at the end of a level was causing the game to slow down. Whether you think it's worthwhile or pointless, the work that Vitor Villela is doing is paving the way for even more SA1 hacks, and I can't wait to see what's next. The world of video game hacks is super expansive. There's so many of them out there, and although it seems like the stupid or bad hacks get all the spotlight these days, there's still a ton of people out there working on more subtle hacks like the ones I've shown you here that improve upon or fix certain aspects of our favorite games. I mean, how cool is it that these features are even possible? And that they're playable on real hardware to boot? To the people working on these, I want you to know that those of us playing and enjoying these hacks truly appreciate the work that you're doing, and that it's not going unnoticed. The entire console's game library in the palm of your hand. There's few ideas in the world of vintage gaming that are as intoxicating as that. Whether it comes down to simply wanting to save on space, sample from a nearly limitless stream of ROM hacks, or prevent wear and tear on aging hardware, it's easy to understand the popularity of flashcards among gaming enthusiasts today. From Retro USB's Power Pack for the NES, to Terra Onion's Mega SD for the Sega Genesis, 
Today, the most well-known and widely used flashcards remain the EverDrive from Ukraine-based developer Crix. In past episodes, we've taken a look at just about all the different EverDrive offerings from the NES, Sega Genesis, Super Nintendo, Game Boy, and beyond. Since then, a number of EverDrives have seen robust firmware updates as well as new hardware revisions to allow for additional features and more. So let's take a look at where these updates stand in 2020 and if they can justify trading up to a new version now or anytime soon. Over the course of the past decade, the surge in popularity of vintage video games has driven the prices of original consoles and cartridges to insane heights. If you're just getting into, or simply just returning to the hobby after many years, the sticker shock might just cause you to throw up your hands and say forget it. While many consoles have been a good outlet for those looking to indulge in a quick hit of nostalgia, the Mr. FPGA continues to assert itself as the ultimate all-in-one solution for the more hands-on aficionado. But for those looking to play on original hardware, it makes sense that flash carts, devices created to allow for the loading of game ROMs, hacks, and more on a variety of consoles, have become somewhat of an essential device in one's gaming repertoire. If you've done any research at all on the subject, you're undoubtedly familiar with the name EverDrive. Designed on a per console basis, an EverDrive can load game ROMs from an SD card so that the original system sees the game as if it was a real thing. EverDrives and other flash carts are insanely useful to not only people looking to just play some games, but also homebrew developers, ROM hackers, content creators, and more. As the lineup of EverDrives have expanded and matured, Crix has adopted a standardized naming scheme to define the power levels of the multitude of revisions. The X3 is the ultra budget friendly option, while the X5 presents the most even keeled balance between functionality and price. The X7 has some super cool and useful features like in-game menus and save states, at the cost of a premium price tag. So what necessitates a new version of an EverDrive? Many times it comes down to outside circumstances. Most common among these factors are various components reaching end of life. Or, in other words, they're just not being manufactured any longer, and it becomes more cost effective to just produce something with newer components. So if you're being forced to redesign an entire device to use newer FPGAs and other parts, you may as well take advantage of the increase in power that comes along with those newer components, right? This has led to top-of-the-line X7 versions of many EverDrives that predate the naming scheme altogether, such as the EverDrive 64, Master EverDrive, and Game Gear EverDrive. In 2019, we were introduced to the Pro series, which usually include interesting abilities that might lie outside the original scope of functionality beyond even the X7 strengths. These enhancements obviously require beefier hardware and generally aren't intended to be replacements for the older versions, but are more for those looking to play as wide of a variety of games as possible. An additional side effect to all these redesigns come down to cartridge voltage. Several years back, Rene from DB Electronics noted that a handful of EverDrives had mismatched voltages to what the system required. This caused additional heat dissipation and as a result, extra wear and tear on the hardware. The devices that were most guilty of this have now received updates to make them more friendly towards the original innards of our favorite systems. That said, it's important to remember that even though support might wane over time, the existence of the new models do not negate the older ones. If you have an older version, it's still totally functional. So it really only comes down to whether or not the new features are meaningful enough for you to want to upgrade. Several of the EverDrives covered in this episode were sent to us by both Stone Age Gamer and Crix so that we can look at these new versions and see what they offer over the older ones to help you decide whether or not it makes sense to upgrade. Among the EverDrives covered in previous videos, there were two in particular that were in pretty dire need of an update, the Master System EverDrive and the Game Gear EverDrive. Sure, some would say that these are probably among the least essential of Sega's consoles, but chances are they probably didn't spend a portion of their formative years with them like some of us. Still, my love for these consoles does nothing to alter the idea that these were likely among the least sought after ever drives available. As such, it makes sense that it took so long for them to receive a thorough overhaul. It's not that the original versions weren't functional, 
but the ultra-slow game loading was likely the biggest turnoff for potential buyers. Well, that, and that Master System games are backwards compatible on the 16-bit Genesis hardware, which likely makes it completely redundant, unless you were dead set on using the original Master System console. Regardless, the arrival of the Master EverDrive X7 in early 2018 was welcome for the small fanbase who were interested in a lavish flash cart for their favorite 8-bit system. The Game Gear EverDrive X7 came two years later, in early 2020, and was undoubtedly of more interest to that system's fans because the games weren't as easily playable on other systems. But also, a flash cart for a handheld system is pretty appealing, especially on one that's as unwieldy as the Game Gear might be. There were no X3 or X5 models of either in tow because the time to develop them would likely take more effort than it was realistically worth. By making the X7 versions available as a wholesale replacement for the original with no other option is akin to gently being told to get it over with and buy the best flashcards these systems will likely ever see. Both of these sell for around 130 US dollars, which is a bit of a markup from the previous versions, but you can expect a good bang for your buck here. The original Master EverDrive used standard size SD cards, but like most devices these days, the X7 has moved on to the more conventional, but easier to lose, micro SD. On the other hand, the original Game Gear EverDrive always used a micro SD, but you needed to completely unscrew and open up the shell to access the slot. The Game Gear X7 has an opening for easy access to the card. Now, because the Game Gear and Master System are so fundamentally similar to each other, it's unsurprisingly that so is the functionality of each of these EverDrives. In fact, both even use the exact same OS, utilizing the same no-frills text-based menu system that is typical of pretty much every EverDrive ever. Navigation is quick and breezy as you scroll through a list of files using the D-pad, and in and out of folders using the 1 and 2 buttons. And what is perhaps the most obvious improvement over the old iterations? Booting up games is now nearly instantaneous across the board with everything that I tested, taking no more than a second or two. While this is good and all, it's most likely the other major update that will be the key factor in convincing people that it's worth upgrading to this newer version. An in-game menu that allows for save states. The in-game menu is tied to a three input hotkey combination that can be set within the option menu. The default sequence is set to simultaneously pressing the D-pad up plus button one and two, which offers the option to save your state, load that save state, and return to the menu. Through no fault of Crix's, the Master System's lack of buttons quickly reveals an unavoidable reality. Certain games will be nearly unplayable with the in-game menu activated, since there's just loads of games out there where you'll be constantly pressing any combination you could possibly choose. The fact is, you'll likely have to rebind the button combination or simply turn it off altogether in certain situations. A last, aka Power Strike, is a good example of just how completely unplayable a game can become. I was disappointed that the Game Gear X7 didn't throw the start button into the mix for setting the hotkey, which would have completely remedied this issue by allowing for such combinations like down plus start. Unless there's some specific hardware reason for not allowing this, hopefully that can be incorporated into future OS updates. There's one extremely important asterisk when it comes to the Master EverDrive and its use of an in-game menu. The trick it uses to access it can only be done on original Master System hardware. If you try to use it on a Genesis through a Powerbase converter, it seems to break compatibility, period. Needless to say, unless you're planning on using the Master EverDrive on an actual Master System, this is probably not the right choice for you. Thankfully, there is another option I'll be talking about later on in the episode. Overall game compatibility was excellent on the older versions, with both being able to boot and play their specific ROMs regardless of region. That standard remains true here, but let's not forget that the Game Gear is fully backwards compatible with Master System and Mark III games, which opens that library to the portable. Of course, the Master EverDrive cannot play Game Gear titles, although there has been a number of conversions to Game Gear ROMs that make them work on the SMS. On the older Master EverDrive, the chances of whether or not these would work was pretty spotty, but I feel that the compatibility is much better with the more powerful hardware. Most of the heavy hitters work fine, such as Gunstar Heroes and Magical Puzzle Popples. Even some fan translations, like the one for Fantasy Star Adventure, have received this treatment. 
Still, you might run into some graphical weirdness, which is usually related to opening up the viewing area of the oftentimes cramped Game Gear resolution. On the topic of Gunstar Heroes, while it might not look it by today's standards, porting the Run and Gun Classic to the Game Gear was an incredible feat for the time. If there was one game that people should check out using the GG EverDrive, this was it. Except, it was one of the few incompatible games on the original. Clearly, this was a priority for Crix, and the game runs on the GG EverDrive X7 exceedingly well. A number of other small incompatibilities have also been ironed out. Finally, Sega SG-1000 games are once again supported with a slightly altered color palette. Compatibility could be spotty before, and based on a little testing, it seems to be quite a bit better now. I expected equal performance between both EverDrives, but that wasn't quite the case. Congo Bongo works flawlessly on the Game Gear, while it's completely broken on the Master System. Thankfully, Dragon Wang runs without issue on both platforms. Like their original versions, one's interest in either of these particular updates come down to how passionate you are about the console. For me, the save states in the Master EverDrive X7 were a pretty big deal for SMS games because they're extremely useful for gathering footage for our videos. The GG EverDrive X7 has a strong appeal because it puts such a large amount of games on a single, and more importantly, portable cartridge. Now, as I did in the previous EverDrive focused episodes, let's take a look at some various things I think you should check out if you end up with one of these carts. Nintendo 64 fans are some of the most passionate out there. It's really impressive. While I don't quite fit in among their ranks, maybe I just never found the right game to really rope me in. That's why the EverDrive 64 was one of the most interesting to me, the sheer number of games on the system that I never had a chance to play. Early on, there were a number of updates, or point versions that incorporated additional features, with the biggest jump being from version 2.5 to 3.0. We checked out the latest and greatest in the first console EverDrive episode. But in September 2019, Crix released the EverDrive 64 X7 for around $180, making it one of the pricier options in the lineup. The X7 represents a nice jump for owners of earlier EverDrive 64 versions, but if you jumped on this train with 3.0, is there really any reason to upgrade? Well, the short and sweet answer, no. I'm sorry to be the bearer of disappointment, but outside of a few hardware tweaks, the X7 is more of a rebranding of version 3.0 than anything else. Even if you're looking for any reason at all to upgrade from a 3.0, said hardware tweaks will do virtually nothing to make the prospect any more enticing. First, the full-sized SD card slot has been moved to the side and replaced with a micro SD slot. And secondly, an Ultra CIC 3 chip allows for auto detection of hardware regions, where on previous versions, you had to flip a physical switch on top of the PCB between NTSC and PAL. The EverDrive 64 version 3 had pretty thorough compatibility, working with just about the entire library. Certain games still need to be patched specifically to work with an EverDrive, such as the Banjo games, but it's safe to say that there's going to be no real disappointments to be had with the X7 in this department. Playing 64 DD conversions is still pretty novel, especially as the price of real DD drives has begun to really skyrocket in recent years. The NES emulator is a cool bonus, but it's not exactly a feature that you're buying this thing for. It should be noted that additional features could be on the way to further bolster its appeal to those looking to upgrade. But in general, the same features I talked about in the previous video apply to the new version, like NES emulation. But there have been other OS updates that I neglected to talk about back then that might be relevant to your interests nowadays. Chief among these is auto patching, which can apply a temporary .ips or .aps patch to a game. This is great news for anyone who wants to dabble around with the anti-aliasing hacks that can be achieved using a game shark, and don't want to go through the hassle of inputting the cheat code on your own. Owners of the Ultra HDMI mod might not be super interested, but this is a great alternative for those without. 
or anyone looking to double dose on anti-aliasing removal. But how effective it is really depends on the game. This used to be done by placing a patch file in the auto folder, but as of firmware 3.04, things have changed a little bit. The patch must now be placed within the same folder as the ROM file, or in the patcher folder. If you choose this method, the patch must be renamed to match the ROM it'll be applied to's 8 alphanumeric character CRC high number. You can get this by looking at the ROM info in the main menu. I have to say that this feels a bit more obtuse than the older method, and can result in a bit of an organizational nightmare. Either your ROM folder is more cluttered than it needs to be, or you have a bunch of patches where you have no idea what game it's associated with. <laughs> The CPAC manager allows you to back up the data on the memory pack that's inserted into your controller. Even though it's mostly third-party games that use this medium for its save files, I'm often surprised just how quickly these things can fill up. Choosing to save the CPAC file as controller number or the last game you played becomes important when deciding if you want to organize your saves just a bit more. If you choose the latter, then keep in mind you'll need to dump the memory pack data before loading something else, lest you want to lose track of what's what. I personally wish this option could be tweaked so that you could automatically dump or load the CPAC file when you choose the last game played method. That would make things infinitely easier to manage and way more reliable. Jim Rivers, get the soil sample! I suppose the topic of save files is a good jumping off point as any for me to briefly mention some of the nicer features you can expect if you're upgrading from an EverDrive 64 2.5 to an X7. Probably the most important, dedicated save file memory. On the older cartridges, you were required to reset the system to write the save file to the SD card. We're talking EEPROM, save RAM, and flash RAM files. If you forgot to do this, then they'd be lost. The X7 keeps them in the memory and writes to the safety of the SD card the next time you turn on the console. This dedicated memory also makes it so that Pokemon Stadium will work. Here's the first move. That did little damage. There, defense that went down. A real-time clock is touted as a big feature, but unless you want to play the fan translation of the original Animal Forest, there's little to no reason for you to even give this a second thought. And lastly, there's a USB port for developers. But if you just want to play some games, this is probably something you don't even care much about. When it comes to the EverDrive 64 X7, the decision is fairly easy if you already have a version 3. Now, if you're still on 2.5, and I'd say it's a pretty good time to upgrade because I can't imagine another version will ever be necessary. From the release of Retro USB's Power Pack in mid-2007, a flash cart for the original Nintendo 8-bit was a dream come true for fans of the system. Crix's NES offering, the EverDrive N8, arrived in 2013 and addressed a number of the shortcomings of the Power Pack, as well as incorporating some cool new features. The subsequent announcement and release of the EverDrive N8 Pro in late 2019 was a bit of a surprise to many, myself included. The N8 had consistently seen robust updates since its inception, with one major update as recent as December of 2019, after the announcement of the Pro. These updates usually included support for additional mapper chips, which were used to enable a variety of enhancements to NES games over the years. Regardless, it was becoming increasingly apparent that the original N8's power was getting close to being tapped out. Like its predecessor, the EverDrive N8 Pro is available in two different form factors, NES and Famicom. Outside of a change from using normal sized SD cards to micro SD, you'd be hard pressed to find any obvious physical traits that separate the old and new style cart's outward appearance. On the other hand, the Famicom version is quite a bit taller than the original. Both sell for around $170. 
which is a $50 price increase over the aging original. This is justified by a thorough set of upgrades, such as a Cyclone 4 FPGA and an improved amp for expansion audio. After seven years, software support was extremely comprehensive on the original N8. This has been carried over to the Pro without missing a beat, and NES, Famicom, and Famicom Disk System are all playable here. In fact, all of the great features that people loved about the original N8 have been improved and iterated upon incrementally, such as being able to activate eight Game Genie codes at one time versus five, and the XFAT file system being supported. Faster game loading is also touted, but I never really felt that was an issue before. Famicom Disk System games will flip sides automatically as it's needed, but in the instance it doesn't work as it should, a physical disk side flip button is there to help you out. The list of supported mappers continues to expand, and as of the time of this video, sits at around 202 for the Pro version versus the 173 of the older version. So, more games are supported, although most of these apply to homebrew games. But more is always better, right? The original N8 allowed for quick saving and loading of states using a two-button combination, a super handy feature for some of the more brutal games in the system. The Pro expands on this ability by giving you the option for a full-on in-game menu, which has up to 99 save state slots available per game. Honestly, this is more than any sane person will ever need, but I find it super useful just in case I need to capture gameplay of certain segments of games in the future. Cycling through the different save states gives the time and date that they were created thanks to the N8's real-time clock, so you can be conscious of not only which saves have been occupied, but also so you don't overwrite your most recent save. Each slot is stored within the Snap folder as individual files so you can easily back them up or share them with other N8 Pro owners if you want. There is something to be said for the quickness of the older method. Thankfully, you can revert to that setting by toggling the in-game menu to QSS via the option menu. The button combination used to access the menu or quickly save and load your state can be set to your preference via the in-game combo menu option. Here's a quick tip, if you happen to have one of those 8-bit dough wireless NES controllers that has a home button, then setting the save state key to down plus select will quickly take you to the in-game menu with a single push of that button. Pretty neat. The audio balance option lets you tweak levels of various expansion audio chips like the VRC6 and Sunsoft 5B. number of presets are included to match with the various Famicom hardware out there, and functions seamlessly when using a Famicom version of the NA Pro with a Famicom console. If you have a North American system, things aren't so cut and dry. There's a mod required that does require a bit of soldering. While some people have done this mod using just a resistor, Voltar has developed a properly attenuated board that sounds great, and installing it is a cinch. If you have a top loader, then you'll need to apply an additional mod to the N8 itself bridging a wire between pins 54 and 51. This is pretty simple for even a novice, but hey, I was a little out of practice when I did it myself. It ain't exactly pretty, but it works. However, if you have a high-def NES HDMI mod installed, or a system like Retro USB's AVS, then you're all set. The expansion audio is handled by the hardware automatically. Speaking of the high-def NES, the first production run of the N8 Pro had a strange hardware incompatibility, which caused issues with NES consoles equipped with this mod, causing a black screen. This has been cleared up with following production runs, and now seems to run flawlessly. If you did end up with one of these early units, and either have, or plan to install a high-def mod at some point, you probably want to contact either Stone Age Gamer or Crix to swap it out. Also of note when it comes to the Pro's audio is the inclusion of a built-in NSF player. NSF stands for Nintendo Sound Format, which is a file type which contains audio information from NES games. Loading up an NSF file will play the music using the original console hardware for your listening pleasure. Fans of the hacking scene will get a lot out of the N8 Pro's increased ROM memory, which allows for some of the more demanding fan hacks out there, such as Rockman 4 Minus Infinity and Zelda The Legend of Link. These are among the upper echelon of fan hacks out there, and are full-fledged games well worth looking into. 
The EverDrive N8 Pro is certainly a worthy upgrade, but represents a bit of a conundrum for those looking to do so. After all, the original was already super good, unless you were looking for support of some of the more obscure games, or some of the beefier fan hacks, or even a nearly endless supply of save state slots, it might be hard to justify the extra cost at this time. Still, there's a lot of horsepower left under the hood that has yet to be unlocked, so the potential for interesting features is pretty great. When Terra Onion announced the Mega SD flash cart in June of 2019, it represented the first true competition that any EverDrive had seen in a significant amount of time. Instead of the Virtua Racing shaped cartridge was an ultra-powerful FPGA capable of emulating Sega CD hardware. For many, such as myself, this was a dream come true. But not one to sit idly, Crick set to work on his own version that could compete. After around a year of development later, we were introduced to the Mega EverDrive Pro, an updated flash cart that featured, you guessed it, Sega CD support. Fitting inside of a standard size cartridge shell, the Mega EverDrive Pro retails for around $200, which is about $35 more expensive than the Mega EverDrive X7, but about $70 cheaper than Terra Onion's offering. A majority of this price difference comes down to components used. The Mega SD offers a little more power, which affords some wiggle room for possible future enhancements. But it's important to keep this in perspective. Terra Onion's Mega SD was released a full year before the Pro and was the first of its kind. In this time, Crooks was able to examine and evaluate it while developing his own, which allowed him to pinpoint exactly where to cut costs while maintaining nearly equivalent functionality, at least for the time being. Of course, developing such a complicated device will have some hiccups along the way. The early days had a number of quirks such as having the combined Sega CD disk images into one file, but Crix has been working to smooth out a lot of these issues and has released one to two updates a month since its launch in June of 2020. As of the time of this video, the most recent version is 4.07, so there's bound to be plenty more tweaks and optimizations in the future. Despite the extra power, the menu layout is the same as it ever was at least at first glance. There's such a simplicity to all the EverDrive menus that I find efficient and comforting. But the most recent update takes a nod from the EverDrive 64 and has an option for a background, animated backgrounds even. As with the Mega EverDrive X7, Sega Genesis functionality remains top tier. Compatibility was close to perfect before, but the Pro notably adds support for the Sega SVP enhancement chip used in Virtua Racing. As is the case with all Genesis flash carts, 32X support is there, but it requires that you have a 32X attached to the system. Due to the nature of how the 32X combines video signals from both the 16-bit hardware and the add-on, it would require some sort of video pass-through to get this working right. As it stands right now, the 40-ish games that use the add-on simply aren't worth the extra effort and cost to justify. As expected, Sega Master System games are supported along with full YM2413FM expansion audio for games that took advantage of this. Although I tend to prefer the PSG sound, the FM sound sounds pretty good to my ears. The in-game menu that was featured in the Mega EverDrive X7 has been given a bit of a power up. You can still access it using a two or three button combination of your choice, but now the save state feature gives you up to 100 save slots per game. 
The built-in real-time clock will let you track the time and date that the save was created. But if you step into the Save Snapshot archive inside the Mega folder, you can actually preview a snapshot of the exact moment the save state was made. This is pretty cool, but I wish it was possible to view these within the in-game menu itself. As it is, it's a novel idea with limited usefulness. Although going in and out of the menu is ultra quick and seamless, there's also an option for a quick save and load button combo that can be used in tandem with the in-game menu. It's not an either-or situation like with the N8 Pro. Being able to rapidly save and reload is super nice for speedrunners who like to practice certain segments over and over again, and I hope that a similar option is added to the N8 Pro in the future. In-game menu performance isn't always perfect though. While it's typical for certain sounds or tones to linger or stop working altogether when going in and out of the in-game menu, there's also risk of graphical corruption, like this one I ran into with Shinobi 3. And yes, it's tied to the save state, so resetting the game and reloading the slot won't help you here. It's a total loss. One surprising feature is the capacity for save states in Sega Master System games, which effectively negates the need for a Master EverDrive X7, unless you're absolutely dead set on playing on an original SMS. A three input combination consisting of a D-pad direction plus buttons B and C is needed to activate it, which leads to the various quirks tied to the Master EverDrive that I mentioned earlier. Strangely, the Mega Pro does give you the option for setting this combo to buttons that aren't even active with the SMS, such as Start and A. Alas, tying any of these inputs to the hotkey simply does not work. As it stands, the Mega SD currently lacks any sort of in-game menu for 8-bit games, much less saving and loading states, and requires a full-on power cycle to get back to the main interface. Also, the in-game menu cannot be accessed if you're using a 32X on anything. When the Mega Everdrive Pro was first revealed, probably the most surprising feature was the inclusion of an NES core. Yes, you can play NES ROMs on your Sega Genesis. No, it's not a replacement for a real NES. It's certainly fascinating that Crix was able to do it, but it's not something I would consider a reason to buy it or anything. Compatibility is spotty, with some real classics either being glitchy or not working at all. Sound is a mixed bag. Music sounds surprisingly good, while sound effects can be way off. Although I'm wondering if this could have anything to do with the slight difference in speed, where the Genesis runs at a slightly lower refresh to the NES. Of course, all this is ancillary to the star of the show, Sega CD support. If the Mega EverDrive Pro is on your radar, then this is likely the reason why. The Mega SD really set a standard upon release, giving you a sizable lineup of tweaks that not only streamline the experience, but also allow you to approximate original hardware in various ways, if you so choose. The Pro might be lacking some of the nuanced sliders and toggles of the SD, but it's entirely possible that some of these aspects are totally inconsequential to you. Before you get into anything, there's two specific factors to keep in mind. First, if you have a real Sega CD connected to your Genesis, you'll want to separate the two. Secondly, Sega CD games need a BIOS file to run. These are obtainable from various corners of the internet, and you'll need to drop them into the specific folder on the SD card as well as rename them based on each region. Games are stored on the SD card nested within their own folders, and can be in a .bin and .q, .iso, and .img format. If you have a multi-disc game, you can put all disc images into the same folder, and the game should swap discs automatically at the necessary time. In some cases, like with Slam City, which has nonlinear progression from disc to disc, it's not always apparent that the change has taken place. It's also led to some glitchiness for me in this particular case. Come on and get it before I serve it to you! On the Mega SD, you can swap discs manually by going into the in-game menu. But as of right now, the Mega EverDrive Pro does not have an in-game menu for Sega CD games. So you'll have to power cycle the system or press the power button on the top of the cartridge itself to reboot. Another area where the in-game menu for Sega CD games gives the Mega SD an advantage over the EverDrive is with the handling of cheats. 
The Mega SC utilizes RAM cheats, which are input and activated via the in-game menu. Doing so will constantly write values to a specific RAM address, which in turn does specific things, like gives you infinite health and so on. Sort of like how a Game Shark or Action Replay work on a PlayStation 1. These can be enabled and disabled at any time during gameplay, although the changes don't always take effect right away. The EverDrive, on the other hand, writes a code to the game's .qsheet file when booting the game. In theory, I suppose this should work fine, but I couldn't find any codes which use this approach for cheats, so I can't be sure how well they work, much less even exist. Most games should see at least some sort of loading speed improvement. Especially egregious examples, like Willy Beamish, are improved so significantly you won't know to do with all the extra time you have left in the day. Other games, you might see a couple of seconds here and there, but it's not exactly world shattering. The greatest relief is not having to worry about the wear and tear on your nearly three decade old optical laser and drive belt. Save files were always a bit of a challenge if you happened to own more than five Sega CD titles. The internal save memory was excruciatingly small, while a backup RAM cart helped alleviate this issue in the long run. With the Mega EverDrive Pro, you can choose to have one single internal and cartridge save pool for all your game saves if you like dealing with original hardware limitations. Or you can choose to have the cart create one of each on a per game basis. Although I haven't quite figured out a workflow for getting my currently existing save files moved over to the Pro yet, I'd definitely say that the latter is an infinitely more useful approach. Oh, just in case it wasn't obvious, like the Mega SD, there is not an option for save states with CD games. One of the most appealing aspects of the Mega SD was the use of MD Fourier to dial in the sound filtering of the Sega CD core to be authentic as possible. But because it was employed so late in production, the sound could not be perfectly matched due to design limitations. The Mega EverDrive Pro used MD Fourier from the beginning and was crafted so that it can accurately match the original sound quality. Both have CD audio treble boost and low pass filter toggles. However, the Mega SD does allow for additional volume level tweaking. One final note on audio. Perhaps the most exciting innovation of the Mega SD was the Mega Drive Plus format, which took inspiration from MSU1 games on the SD to SNES and allowed for CD audio combined with cartridge games. This was possible on real hardware, but was never utilized by anyone outside of indie developer Watermelon for their game Pure Solar. Since the release of the MSD, there's been several Mega Drive Plus releases worth checking out. Although seemingly still in the early stages of development, Crix has created MSU-MD, the EverDrive equivalent to MD+. A welcome addition for sure, but in its current state, these enhanced audio ROMs can be a bit obtuse to figure out and get working. You need to move .ips patches around and rename files, but hopefully this will be streamlined in the future. Compared to the Mega Drive Plus implementation, this feature works well, but it's missing the ability to seamlessly loop tracks at specified points, which doesn't quite make for as fluid of an experience. Finally, a fascinating addition is the Mega Color Video Player, which allows for smooth, high color video playback on your Genesis system. I don't know how this was done, but it's incredibly impressive. It's more of a novelty right now, but as it evolves, I can't help but wonder if we might see ports of some Sega CD games with nicer video in the future. The Mega EverDrive Pro is certainly a great addition to the overall lineup. Some might feel sad that they didn't hold out for the Mega Pro, while others are thrilled with the more refined options of the Mega SD. But think about it. The beautiful thing about two of these devices being on the market is that the competition drives innovation, and we, the consumer, benefits the most. If a unique feature is present in one version, chances are it's only a matter of time before it shows up in the other. When the life cycle of both carts are complete, their functionality will probably be nearly identical. 
And the last thing you'll be thinking about is whether you saved $70 years ago or that you had an extra year to enjoy the benefits of Sega CD games on a flash card. Although that brings us to the end of the newest ever drives available, there is one final device that lies on the periphery that I think it's high time that we revisit. I'm talking, of course, about the ST to SNES Pro, which arrived to mixed reactions in early 2019. But before we get into that, let's step back in time and take a look at all the incredible ways the original ST to SNES has evolved since we last had a look. Since its release, the SD to SNES, developed by Akari 01, quickly became the de facto standard by which all future flash carts would be judged. Despite a higher than normal price tag than your average flash cart, its beefy hardware, along with some stellar programming, has led to an incredibly long tail of development. Amazingly enough, new features are still being added to this day. Before we get into the real good stuff here, I think it's worth noting some of the smaller tweaks to the SD to SNES's repertoire that don't get enough love. I'm talking about the LED brightness level. No, not really, but I was pleasantly surprised to see it added at an OS level. No more electrical tape for me. But seriously, owners of a one-chip console will want to direct their attention to the transient fixes and brightness limit settings. It's known that stock one-chip consoles output too bright of an image, resulting in loss of detail. This can be addressed by either installing a properly attenuated RGB bypass kit, or using HD Retrovision component cables with the brightness switch turned off. If you don't have either of these, then the brightness limit setting will be your best friend. I found that negative one seems to be the sweet spot for me, but you might want to test some of the other values to see which works best for you. One chip transient fixes is more specific, is designed to fix some of the issues that are inherent to one chip systems. It also accounts for some of the weirdness that can arise if the C11 capacitor has been replaced. For more info on both of these issues, check out RGB309 of the RGB Masterclass here on Emlig. All right, now onto the good stuff. Thanks to the dedication of a programmer known as Red Guy, support for the remaining heavy hitter expansion chips was achieved in 2018. Obviously, I'm talking about Super FX and SA1 which were long thought to be nearly impossible given the complexity of integrating these add-ons. SuperFX support was extremely timely thanks to the official release of the long-since-canceled Star Fox 2 on the SNES Classic Edition. Being able to play it on original hardware was a real treat, unless you decided to spring for a reproduction cartridge of it. For many, though, the real highlight of this edition means support for Yoshi's Island. For better or worse, these games run at their normal frame rate, although the menu system does have a setting for Super FX speed. Toggling this to fast seems to speed up the game's overall speed, but it doesn't seem to increase the frame rate. In practice, this means there will be times when certain sound effects, such as the radio chatter in Star Fox, won't have time to finish before the next sample plays. <laughs> Ultimately, it's not too much of a hindrance, but it will seem off for those who know the games extremely well. SA1 support unlocks 34 games. Kirby Superstar and Super Mario RPG are the big ones that will pop in most people's minds. For me, being able to play the fan translation of the Eiji Aonuma directed Marvelous is where the real party is. The only major limitation of SA1 games is that there's simply not enough room left on the FPGA to allow for MSU1 enhanced audio. Slightly disappointing, but a small price to pay considering the SA1 was thought to have never been possible in the first place. A 
Another new addition is the SDD1 chip, which isn't nearly as exciting as the previous two. It's most recognizably used in the SNES version of Street Fighter Alpha 2, which is an impressive, if inessential, port of the CPS2 game. The announcement of the SD to SNES Pro, I think many buyers of the original felt a little bit burned. The original was touted as a final design, meaning that it was so powerful, it would never need an update. And as Super FX and SA1 were added, this inspired even more confidence. So it's easy to see why owners of the seemingly out of date original hardware were annoyed. But with so many components of the original no longer being produced, designer Akari01 and manufacturer Crix had little choice in the matter. An even bigger surprise came in late 2019 when the SD to SNES received a complete rebrand to become the FX Pack Pro. Like the name or hate it, this change was due to the pressure from several corporations, Panasonic, SanDisk, and Toshiba for using the initials SD in the device's name. More powerful tech and a move to micro SD aside, as of right now, the new hardware has meant very little in the overall scope of things. Most newly developed features are supported by both the Classic and the Pro, although there are some minor Pro exclusive features which have begun to creep in here and there, such as SA1 games being able to use MSU1 enhanced audio. The FX Pack Pro retails for the same price as the original, around 200 bucks. If the allure of future-proofing and new technology is too strong, Stone Age Gamer offers a trade-in program so you can soften the blow just a little bit. Filed away under, I would have never thought of this when I did the first flashcard video, is Super Game Boy support. Popping up seemingly out of nowhere from a developer going by the name of Redacted173, this unexpected surprise is not integrated in the official firmware as of the time of this video, but it's only a matter of time since they've been working with Akario 1 to make it a standard feature. Best of all, Super Game Boy is supported across the board, so whether you have the original SD to SNES or an FX Pack Pro, you're free to enjoy some Donkey Kong 94 and the loads of games that came out for the iconic portable. As of right now, you'll need to procure the required BIOS files from the internet to make it work. But once that's done, just select a Game Boy title from your SD card, and you're off. Standard operations of the Super Game Boy apply here. Game Boy and Super Game Boy Enhanced games work just as they would with a real Super Game Boy. Obviously, Game Boy Color titles will not work, but there were several cross-generation carts which had black shells, like Link's Awakening DX, that will. Press L and R simultaneously within a game to set your border, color palette, and button layout. The evolution of Super Game Boy support has been really something to behold, offering some really cool options in its current state. Initially meant to emulate only the more speed accurate Super Game Boy 2, you can now select the slightly faster clock speed of the original Super Game Boy. And yes, MSU1 support for Game Boy is now a reality, and it's not exclusive to the Pro only. You can expect this feature to work on the Classic as well. <laughs> Also surprising, save states. By holding X and pressing L or R, you can save and load states. Pretty handy. Of course, basic in-game hook functionality applies here. Just hold L, R, select, and X to return to the main menu. So what sort of upgrades lie in the future for the FX Pack Pro? We know that an oft-requested save state feature is in the works thanks to a developer and speedrunner named Furious. And there might be a chance that we might see enhanced frame rates for Super FX games too. To be honest, outside of those, I'd be hard pressed to think of any more killer features that really need to be added. Well, outside of the tiny handful of as of yet unsupported helper chips, that is.
So there you go, the state of the newest EverDrive releases as of 2020. What do you think? It bears repeating that the existence of new versions does not mean that your old EverDrives will cease to work. If you've been perfectly content with them up to this point, there's probably little reason to upgrade right now. But if some of these features are just what you've been waiting for, then have at it. In a time when there's constant new developments coming out of the retro gaming enthusiast scene, devices like flashcards are still amazing to me. Even though they've been around for the better part of 15 years, that they're still being iterated upon with increased functionality is a testament to just how essential they are for not only newcomers, but longtime fans as well. Let's face it, flashcard fans have had it real good over the past few years with loads of different options appearing on their favorite cartridge-based systems. These accessories have become essential for people who prefer to play 8 and 16-bit games on original hardware, but are interested in expanding their horizons when it comes to games on each console, or simply avoiding wear and tear on their game collection. As we move to the 32-bit generation and beyond, achieving this becomes exponentially more complex. Sure, the disk-based media that most systems use from here on out opened up nearly limitless possibilities. But moving parts like motors and gears and drives as well as the more fragile nature of disks themselves came as a compromise. In recent years, we've really begun to see the proliferation of optical disk emulators, or ODE for short, on classic CD-ROM-based consoles. These devices provide a way to play disk-based games off of solid-state media, such as an SD card. Let's check out the Terra Onion mode, one such device that can replace the disk drive in your Sega Saturn, Dreamcast, and most recently, Sony PlayStation. Flash cartridges have become real popular in recent years as a method of playing older games, hacks, and homebrew without software emulation. To achieve the same goal with systems that use CDs and other disk-based media has proven to be a much bigger hurdle. The idea behind optical disk emulators isn't exactly a new one, but it's much less mature in the world of video games. Don't let the name confuse you. The overarching idea of an ODE is that it serves as a replacement of the optical drive, so the hardware otherwise still functions as normal. I covered the Rhea and Phoebe in a previous episode, which did exactly this on the Sega Saturn. But in the years since, the rules of what defined an ODE began to blur. Terra Onion themselves incorporated different methods of utilizing ODE tech with the Super SD System 3 for the PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16, and the Mega SD for the Sega Genesis. These were plug-and-play alternatives for their CD-ROM add-ons. While the SSD S3 had a bit of a bumpy road at first because it needed to also provide video outputs, the Mega SD was a revelation and really became a must-have accessory for fans of the Sega and Mega CD. 32-bit and beyond is a different beast though. The Rhea and Phoebe for the Sega Saturn and the GDMU for the Dreamcast were among the first of their kind on the scene for their respective platforms. Unfortunately, and much to the dismay of fans lining up to purchase these mods, they became frustratingly hard to get as word of mouth of their usefulness began to spread. Before long, no-name clone versions of the GDMU began to flood the market. But to many's surprise, the Rhea and Phoebe ODEs remained uncloned for whatever reason. Faced with a hungry market, a number of developers set to creating their own alternatives. Professor Abrasive made enormous waves when he discovered how to circumvent the Saturn's security, which led to the development of the Sadiator, a plug-and-play solution that inserts into the MPEG cart slot on the back of the console, and can load games off an SD card. And then you have the Fenrir, which was revealed in early December 2019 by developer Sed. The Fenrir's low cost of entry and generally simple installation made it an easy choice for those interested in a Saturn ODE, despite some early console compatibility challenges. In April of 2020, Terra Onion, riding high in the success of the Mega SD, revealed Mode, 
an FPGA-based optical disc emulator that will work in all variants of Sega Saturn hardware and supports microSD, flash, and typical SATA drives, solid state, and mechanical. However, the most appealing idea behind the mode is tied to the M in its name. Mode stands for Multi Optical Disc Emulator. The premise being that it's able to automatically detect what system it's plugged into and load a dedicated interface for that system. When it made its way into consumer hands in July of 2020, the mode supported both the Sega Saturn and the Sega Dreamcast. Although it retails for around 230 US dollars, the ability to use it in two different consoles helped in justifying the cost. Terra Onion provided us with a mode review unit for the purpose of covering in this video. Installing the mode in both systems is fairly simple. You'll need to open up the system and remove the old disk drive. So yes, it is plug and play, but there is some legwork required. At least there's no soldering involved, if that sort of thing makes you nervous. Although enabling some of the optional features do need it. With the Saturn, you need to remove the four pegs that suspend the CD-ROM drive, and that requires taking off the heat shield. You also need to pinch a power cable for the mode itself in between the pins of the power supply. Honestly, this is a bit harder than it sounds, and took me longer than anything else during my initial installation. Since then, Mobius StripTech has released a power harness that fits on the pins before the power supply slips on, making the whole thing way less of a hassle. The mode works for both 20 and 21 pin Saturns, for the uninitiated, this relates to the ribbon that is connected to the CD-ROM drive. Most Model 1 systems, aka the ones with the oval power and reset buttons, used 20-pin connectors. Model 2s had circular power and reset buttons and used 21-pin connectors. Comparatively, the Dreamcast installation is significantly more straightforward. Once you remove the original GD-ROM drive, the connector on the underside of the mode will fit right into the now vacant port which passes data and supplies power. In addition, the mode will only work on VA0 and VA1 model Dreamcast consoles. This info is located on the bottom of the console, next to the region. No matter what system you're installing in, you'll want to use the included plastic feet that snap into the four holes on the PCB. These ensure that the mode is at the correct height to avoid additional strain on the connectors. These feet have an optional sticky tape adhesive on them to prevent sliding around, but it's not completely necessary. I personally only mounted two feet in each console and left the other two on the device itself. The surface of the mode has a number of ports and buttons. In addition to the previously mentioned ribbon ports and power connectors, you have the SATA, USB, and micro SD slot for your storage options. However, keep in mind that the positioning of the USB and SATA ports prevent you from having both occupied at the same time. There's a couple of buttons that are used to swap disks and reset to the menu, as well as an expansion port that is currently reserved for future use. The JST9 expansion connector port can be used to enable additional functionality such as region and access LED blinking. I got the most use out of this port by connecting it to my DC Digital HDMI mod which lets you reset back to the mode's menu or do a disk swap directly from within the DC Digital's interface. Whether or not this is worth the extra effort is up to you, as you'll need to purchase a harness that is sold separately and have some soldering skills. For years, the PSIO had a corner on the PlayStation 1 market when it came to ODEs. In 2020, renewed competition came in the form of the X Station from Rama. Shortly after, in October of 2020, PS1 support also arrived on the mode, bringing the total number of systems supported to three. However, there's a couple of very important caveats to consider when it comes to all PS1 ODEs. First, they only work on specific models of the console. In the case of the mode, it'll only work on a system with a PU18 motherboard, which are primarily only in model 5500 consoles, although select 7000 models have also been known to have it. Secondly, is due to the PS1's copy protection security, it's not possible for any ODE mod to be plug and play. You'll need to solder a mod chip, or in this case, a PCB on the underside of the motherboard. After that, you have to lift some pins on the CXD2545Q chip. This is where things get pretty hairy. It might not be difficult for seasoned modders, but this will absolutely put ODE support for PS1 fans out of reach if you have no experience with this kind of stuff. 
A couple of minor shell-related mods are also needed to make sure that the mode fits in the system nicely. Finally, a plastic shield sits over the board to protect it. Compared to the Saturn and Dreamcast installations, I have to admit that the way that the mode sits inside of the PS1 isn't exactly the most elegant thing. I couldn't even put the top on without an insanely thin 2.5 inch hard drive. If you're set on putting the mode in a PS1 and you meet all the requirements, Mobius StripTech sells the kit which includes all the needed parts and PCBs for around $20. The kit is also expected to be offered by Stone Age Gamer in the future. If the removal of the disk drives in any of these consoles strikes you as looking a bit unsightly, definitely check out Laser Bear Industries who designs and sells an array of 3D printed modules for a much more flush look. And they also make it much easier to hit those surface mounted buttons. All right, close up your system and you're good to go. Although you might want to hold off on using the screws to completely seal the system right now. Whether it be moving the mode between different consoles or adding games to the variety of drives, you'll find yourself taking off the top a whole bunch while you get all the games situated in the way that you like them. The mode supports a variety of file types across different consoles. .bin and Q and .iso are the most typical disk images you'll come across when it comes to CD-based games. Although you might also run into .cdi, .ccd, and .mdf here and there. Dreamcast games are often seen as .gdi files, but you might also come across them as .cdi images. These versions have been compressed or had dummy data removed to shrink them down so they can fit on a CDR. You should format your storage to either FAT32 or XFAT. At the root, make a folder for each system you're planning to use it with. Each system will only see the files within its respective directory. Saturn for Saturn, Dreamcast for Dreamcast, and PSX for PlayStation. From there, you're welcome to organize files and directories as you see fit, as long as each game goes in its own folder. The modes menu is handled at the firmware level, and all three are contained within one file. When booting a system, it'll detect what console it's attached to and boot the correct interface. For anyone who's been on the fence of choosing between the mode and one of the other devices that have roughly the same basic functionality, the mode's menu navigation is one of the two main features that I feel really makes it stand out against the competition. The menu itself is displayed at 240p on the PlayStation 1, 480i on the Saturn, and either 480i or 480p on the Dreamcast. There was a point where I hoped for a 240p display option for the Saturn, but realistically, games on the system switch between video modes so frequently that it wouldn't make much of a difference. Besides, now that I've seen the PS1's 240p menu, it's just way too blurry. I think that certain aspects would need to be overhauled completely, such as the font, for it to work. I'm guessing that the main reason for the forced 480i is likely the cover art list option for the Saturn and Dreamcast, but it's yet to come to the PlayStation 1. To use the covers, you have to download a database file from Terra Onion's website and place it on the SD card. The covers definitely give more personality to your digital game collection, but they tend to load so slowly on the Saturn that it's tough to say if it's worth using. Thankfully, the Dreamcast loads these images so much faster. I understand that it's playing the games is the most important, but I'm big on sorting my games into various subdirectories to keep them organized. And as of right now, that's something that most of the competition is lacking. However, firmware management and updates brings us to one of the more divisive aspects of not only the mode, but all of Terra Onion's products. It's tied to a serial number. So you'll need to go to Terra Onion's website, create an account, and register the device to download future updates, which will only install if it has a matching serial number. Along with the menu, support for multiple storage devices is the mode's other killer feature. Using a hard drive or SSD has the potential to give you enough space to hold each system's entire game library if you wanted to be especially gluttonous. If you're using a micro SD card at the same time, these do not show up in one consolidated list. You have to switch between each storage with a press of a button. I personally really like this approach because I like to put all the game images I ripped myself onto the SD card while using the larger storage for other stuff like hacks, fan translations, and uh, more. And what is probably my biggest complaint? I wish that there's just a way to transfer games between storage within the mode interface. This would eliminate the need to open up the system, take out the SSD, and add files to it. I'd much prefer to copy new stuff to the micro SD, 
boot up the system and then transfer it to the SSD that way. However, I've heard that this functionality is in the works for a future firmware update, so here's hoping that it arrives relatively soon. Accessing the modes menu brings up a ton of different options that vary from system to system. For the most part, these are made up of video output choices, system reset behaviors, and region selection options. You might find the selection to be a bit more sparse on the PlayStation 1, but that could be because the compatibility is still fairly new right now. However, note that some of these require specific mods and then need to be connected to the JST9 harness to work. The region patching will automatically apply a patch to let you play games from other regions than the system is from. It's just best to leave this on. The option isn't present on the PS1 because the additional mod board that was applied during installation also functions as a mod chip. Reset input behavior and reset output signal determine how a system behaves when you reset a game either via an in-game shortcut or via the physical button on the system. Soft reset to menu will take you back to the mode menu instead of the BIOS menu when you use a system's native reset button combo. Normally, if you were to open the disc lid when playing a game, you'd likely get an error or get kicked out back to the system's BIOS screen. The disable lid switch toggle prevents this and is especially important if you plan on keeping your system half naked so it's easier to move the mode between consoles or swap out storage devices. Fastboot skips the system's boot up animation once you select a game to start. Supposedly, this can cause the game not to boot properly from time to time, but I've personally never run into this issue. If a game doesn't seem to be running right and you have this option enabled, try turning it off and see if that fixes it. On the Dreamcast, Auto VGA Patch does not require a mod and will patch a game for 480p output, even if the game doesn't support it. Of course, there are some notable exceptions where this won't work, such as with Hydro Thunder. GD-ROM Seek Speed is meant to improve compatibility with problematic disk images, while GD-ROM Read Speed can enhance load times, but the overall benefits of this can vary from game to game. Other systems don't have an equivalent option, Perhaps it's a hardware limitation, but I think it's fair to say that you can expect at least subtly faster load times for most games. I suppose the last thing that needs to be addressed when it comes to the menu is how multi-disc games are handled. When sorting games on your storage, you should put all the discs for one game into the same folder. When selecting that game, it'll place all the discs in a queue, and you can choose what disc to boot up. When a game reaches their natural disc swap point while you're playing, open the lid, hit the switch on the mode board, and this will load the next disc in the queue. I gotta say, I really like how this is handled. It makes sense, it's just quick and easy. So, is that it? Well, in terms of basic functionality, yeah, I suppose it is. But, one of the most enticing aspects of a flash cart is the additional feats that they can perform that lie outside of the realm of what plain old original hardware can do. Is an ODE capable of the same kind of benefits? Well, in some ways, yes and in other ways, no. Let's take a look at some of the cool things you should check out if you find yourself with a mode or equivalent ODE. I think it's fair to say that one of the biggest draws of a device like a flash cart or an ODE is the ability to play fan translations and hacks. Of course, disc-based games are significantly larger in size than cartridges, so there's definitely a bit more work involved for those who want to create these. In recent years, the release schedule of hacks and translations has increased from a trickle to a pour, with some super cool things having popped up in the last year alone. In the late 90s, Grandia on the Saturn was one of those Japanese exclusive RPGs that I was just dying to play. For years, rumors swirled of working designs doing a localization, but a falling out with Sega put an end to that. In 1999, it showed up on the Sony PlayStation, and by the end of the year, we had it in English, at last. It's well known that a number of compromises were made to put the game on the PS1, but it was good enough. The translation is pretty decent. I even have a soft spot for the, uh, not great voice acting. Don't worry, a punch like that, nothing to it. Thanks to Trekkies Unite 118, we can finally enjoy the best of both worlds. The Saturn version of Grandia, with the PlayStation 1 translation, and it is awesome. In much the same vein, we have Lunar the Silver Star, 
which takes the working design's English localization from the PlayStation 1 version and transplants it into the Sega Saturn game. There's also an MPEG card version in the works for those who have that accessory, which will allow for enhanced FMVs. It still has some bugs that need to be squashed, but it's coming along nicely. Thanks to Trekkies Unite 118, Mr. Conan, Ms. T, and everyone who's been working hard on this project. It's one of my favorite games of all time. La, la. For a system with such a short lifespan, it's pretty amazing just how many weird Dreamcast games had English localizations. Of course, there were plenty that didn't. Thanks to a translation by Kargaden, we can finally experience Napple Tail, Arcea in Daydream. This curious 3D platformer features compelling characters like a uh, frog in a car and has an insane amount of text. Shenmue is likely the most iconic game on the Dreamcast, but plenty will say that the stilted English voice acting brings the overall experience down. For those people, we have the Shenmue Undub, which restores the original voiceovers. Just don't forget to switch your settings to game mode so that you have subtitles. Don't worry, the PlayStation isn't missing out on the action. I mentioned the Tales of Fantasia translation from Fantasian Productions in a previous video, which is still great to check out. But how about the translation of Ace Combat 3 Electrosphere from Team Nemo? The US release of this had all sorts of content removed, such as the entire storyline, cutscenes, and even some missions, all of which amounted to an entire disc worth of stuff. Now you can play it as it was truly meant to be played. Brave Prove is one of those games that probably would have been considered a cult classic if it was localized back in 1998, but I suppose we'll have to settle for this fan translation. This overhead action RPG feels like an evolution of the late 16-bit gen greats like Terranigma, with nice looking sprites and a soaring overworld theme. <laughs> Of course, no mention of fan translations would be complete without the impeccable translation of Police Knots, the long sought after follow-up to Hideo Kojima's Snatcher. This graphical point-and-click adventure spans three discs and has all the quirks, plot twists, and detailed explanations for the most trivial things that we love about any Kojima game. This translation also exists for the PlayStation 1 version of the game. If you're looking for one translation to play on your ODE, this is the one. Check out policenots.net for more info. So, on the hacks and homebrew side of things, there might not be as wide of a range of random stuff as there is with cartridges, but there's still some fun things and useful hacks you should check out that might just pique your interest. Senile Team's Beats of Rage compilations for the Dreamcast is a rousing, ridiculous series of brawlers that use sprite rips and gameplay enhancements from a bunch of different games to make something that is much better than these sorts of things usually tend to be. You've got mashups of King of Fighters, SNK vs. Capcom, Double Dragon, Streets of Rage, there's even this silly road rash brawler where you throw bikes and their motorcycles across the screen as if they were a ragdoll. Usually I tend to hate these Mugen type games, but this one is 100% more fun than you think it is. Some of the more interesting hacks coming out for the Saturn are those that incorporate Capcom's 4 meg RAM enhancement cart, which have been created by YZB. Castlevania Symphony of the Night was the first such hack to appear, which speeds up loading, smooths out animations, and has a bunch of quality of life tweaks to the controls. Although it can't solve all the slowdown issues, it does a pretty good job of making it much more playable. Since this release, there have been 4 meg enhanced versions of King of Fighters 95 and 96, and Ultraman. Although, I couldn't get that one to run correctly. It would just sit on the loading screen. If you have a RAM cart, try these out for sure and hopefully you'll have better luck with Ultraman than I did. I love me some light gun games, but there's several for the PS1 that I've never had the chance to play because I don't have one of Konami's Justifier guns for the system. 
I just have Namco's GunCon. If you're in the same situation, well, you're in luck. There's a set of patches that takes three light gun games, Crypt Killer, Die Hard Trilogy, and Lethal Enforcers 1 and 2, and makes them work with the, let's face it, vastly superior light gun. <laughs> If you've been following this channel for a while, you know how I can get about backing up and preserving save files. For years, there's been plenty of options for doing this with cartridges, many of which I covered in its own episode. But systems that used internal RAM required a bit of work, and the Saturn was especially challenging in this regard. I've experimented with a device called the Saturn Data Link that used the I.O. port on the top of an action replay cart. Although it could only dump and restore the complete contents of your internal backup RAM at one time, it worked decently. With the most recent firmware update, this exact ability was added to the mode's main menu, which is huge for backing up those especially easy to lose save files. But thanks to a programmer named Slinga, we now have a mode version of the save game copier, which allows you to dump and restore individual save files from both the internal save RAM and a backup RAM cart using the mode's SD card. The same files can then be stored away on your PC for safekeeping or sharing with others. There's a disk image for your mode that you can download alongside your firmware files on Terra Onion's website. But I recommend grabbing the newest version from Slinga's GitHub instead, because several new updates have appeared since the initial release. It's still a bit finicky and can be a little bit slow sometimes, but that is a relatively small hassle for people who care about this kind of stuff, like myself. Of course, I've saved the most exciting for last. Dreamcast fans were shocked when a developer named Megavolt85 dropped a link on the Dreamcast Talk forums to a port of Metal Slug 6. The catch being that this was a port of the Atomus Wave arcade hardware version, whose hardware shares a lot of similarities to the Dreamcast. These games never appeared on the DC because it was already dead by the time it debuted in the arcades. Thanks to the added benefits of an ODE like the mode, Metal Slug 6 and other games that were locked to that platform are now playable on the Dreamcast hardware. Since October of 2020, Megavolt 85 has cranked out ports to at least 20 Atomus Wave games. There's so much good stuff here to explore, especially for fighting game fans. The time of retribution, battle one, decide the destiny. <laughs> The Fist of the North Star one-on-one -on -one fighting game has some of the most insanely gorgeous sprites I've ever seen. Unfortunately, many of the SNK fighters, such as King of Fighters 11, have some pretty terrible filtering on the characters and look horrendous by today's standards. Ranger mission. Heck, there's even a couple of cool light gun games, if you have a CRT that can run at 480p. But if you know my game tastes, it's a given that one Atomus Wave game that I've been dying to play is Dolphin Blue, a side-scrolling run and gun that feels absolutely refreshing in 2021, with the bright blue skies and great looking sprites. <laughs> Playing these games on the mode should essentially be seamless if you have the newest firmware, but you might notice some frame rate stutter and slow loading in some games. In this case, create a text file within each game's folder and call it mode.cfg. In that document, type block delay equals 00, 0 on one line and flags equals 7 on the following and save it. This should essentially remove any sort of locks on the mode and allow it to slightly overclock itself so that it can run these games smoother. I'm told that this won't have any negative effects on the Dreamcast and shouldn't have any on the mode device itself. What an amazing gift to Dreamcast fans, right? Some of these games even have hacks that allow for widescreen support. I can't believe that I'm finally able to play Dolphin Blue after seeing blurry screenshots of it online over 15 years ago. With three supported systems under its belt, the mode is a robust and powerful ODE. Seeing that it was designed to support as many systems as possible, it's pretty exciting to think about which systems may be able to use it in the future. Even if the mode is your ODE of choice, or you choose something else, 
It's so nice to be able to explore some of these game libraries whose prices have become so far out of reach for the majority of their fans. After years of struggling, we're finally at a place where there's plenty of readily available options for everyone. Everyone loves a good deal. That's why game companies have been bundling popular titles together since decades ago. Today, compilations of classic games have become some of the most reliable and accessible methods of exploring the history of various series and publishers. But sometimes you'll find a classic game included with a brand new game as a bonus. These extras may be listed as a bullet point on the back of the box, but are generally not present as a selling point that overshadows the main game. Let's take a closer look at some of these games within games, because it's easy to forget that some of these were even there in the first place. Heck, you never know. Maybe we'll discover some of the best ways to play some of the most significant games in history. Or maybe some of the worst. Developers have been sneaking in extra games for a long time. In an age where most games can be downloaded in seconds to play on real hardware or emulators, it can be easy to forget that it used to be pretty novel when an extra game was included as a bonus. After all, most were once full price games themselves, so it felt like a really huge deal to get them for free. We're going to be looking at a whole bunch of these types of games in this episode, but what exactly is our criteria that justifies a game within a game? I'm guessing that many people thought of Super Mario Bros. and Duck Hunt when they first saw the title of this episode, but both games are given equal billing on the package. We aren't counting any games that are specifically labeled as collections or compilations. Others may have thought about the battle game in Super Mario 3, which can be directly accessed from the Mario 3 title screen in Super Mario All-Stars. This may look like the Mario Bros. arcade game, but in practice, it's just too different to truly consider it the same game. It's just a mini game. A pretty fun one, though. The same can be said for the Gradius game in Mystical Ninja, or Fantasy Zone in Arnold Palmer Golf. At a glance, these look like the originals, but they're radically reduced. Only one tiny level each, so they're just fun easter eggs. Super Mario Bros. Deluxe on the Game Boy Color gets close with its Super Mario Bros. for Super Players, which is essentially Super Mario 2, aka the Lost Levels. But it's incomplete, graphical and mechanical alterations aside, worlds 9 and A through D are not present so we wouldn't really consider this a suitable replacement for the real thing. That said, the kind of examples we'll be looking at can be summed up nicely by Pitfall The Mayan Adventure. This 1994 sequel slash revival features incredible animation and it was released on just about every console at the time. By entering a button code at the title screen, you can relive the influential Atari 2600 Pitfall Adventure, which is visually faithful, I mean, that shouldn't be that hard, but the sound isn't exactly the greatest. Unfortunately, the original Pitfall seems to have been omitted from the 2001 Game Boy Advance release. Hidden games are good and all, but probably the most common occurrence of games within games is as a reward for beating a game's story mode, or overcoming certain challenges along the way. One of my favorite examples of this is in the Ninja Gaiden reboot on the Xbox. Hidden throughout the story mode are the original trilogy of games, except these aren't the NES versions as you'd expect. For some reason, Team Ninja decided to include the Super NES remakes that were part of Ninja Gaiden Trilogy. This was maybe not the greatest choice, but it's certainly an interesting one, and I can appreciate that. These games are definitely inferior to the NES entries in just about every aspect, most notably in the sound department. The melodies just didn't seem to jive with the SNES's sample-based sound. Despite that, the game supports 480p, and so do these versions. 
Everything appears to be scaled correctly with no scrolling shimmer that I noticed. Although the color in each game does appear to be slightly desaturated, it works in their favor, giving them sort of a look akin to the original non-one-chip SNES console. The presence of passwords were a nice quality of life addition to the SNES games, and by extension, here as well. These games are of decent length, so having them incorporated here is quite welcome. This trilogy was removed from the release of Ninja Gaiden Black, and replaced with the vastly inferior arcade game. I'd love to show that to you as well, but I don't have a save with it unlocked. Regardless, the arcade game is a step down from the NES trilogy in just about every respect, making this a compelling reason to own both Ninja Gaiden Black and the original release. Not to mention, none of these bonus games make an appearance in the PlayStation 3 Sigma release. Not all these are within the game itself. There's several instances where the developer has bundled a bonus disc with an additional game on it in the package. The US release of Strider 2 on the PlayStation 1 included the arcade game on its own disc. When most people address this release, it's always about how the disc art was reversed. Strider 2 was on a disc labeled Strider and vice versa. While this is a fun anecdote, what they should be really talking about is how this is essentially the best version of the first Strider to ever be released on the home market. Built from the ground up from scratch, it's supposedly an arcade perfect port with all the animation and music intact. The only real downfall being a loading screen between each level which isn't even that big of a deal in the first place. After you beat the game, you gain access to a number of bonus options, such as remix music, and the ability to customize Strider Hiryu with different colored outfits. It seems like there was a lot of love put into this port, and the additions make it more than just a simple arcade conversion. Now that you have a better understanding of what we're looking for, let's take a look at how Nintendo's taken advantage of their classic titles over the years. By the late 90s, game consoles had become capable enough to emulate classic games, so it wasn't uncommon to see developers dig into their back catalogs to include nice little bonuses without having to fully port their older games to new hardware. With a rich history of releases to draw from, Nintendo began to dabble in including some of their older games with new releases. Donkey Kong 64 is one of the N64's most massive games. Rare's attempt to convert Donkey Kong Country into a 3D platformer pushed the limits of attention spans by packing the world full of so many collectibles that finishing the game can take more time than an RPG. Among the game's many bonuses are two important titles from both the histories of Rare and Nintendo. Ever the vocal advocate for the earliest generations of gaming, Cranky Kong will begin to challenge the player to beat his high score in Jetpack after a certain point in the game. In fact, doing so is required to even finish the main game. Jetpack was developed for the ZX Spectrum by brothers and Rare co-founders Tim and Chris Stamper, their first game released under their previous company name, Ultimate Play the Game. The game is actually represented quite cleanly in DK64, especially with Ultra HDMI mod as shown here. Jetpack has also been remade and emulated on Xbox platforms, but this remains the game's only official appearance on Nintendo hardware. The original Donkey Kong can also be found in DK64's Frantic Factory level. As with Cranky Kong's Jetpack Challenge, the rewards for finishing Donkey Kong must be collected to beat DK64. This version is notable for actually being based on the original arcade release, which Nintendo has only sparsely republished over the years, instead favoring the NES port, which is lacking the arcade game's second level, the Cement Factory. 
The vertical scaling is a bit off here compared to Jetpack, which is most apparent when Mario is riding an elevator in Stage 3. The sound is also a bit muffled and distorted, but I like to think that's a conscious artistic choice. So, with the N64, it was starting to become viable for Nintendo to use emulation commercially. A number of these early emulation experiments would continue to appear over the course of the early 2000s. Now, a few of these, like the Ocarina of Time and Master Quest Collection and the Zelda Collector's Edition, were given away in separate packages as pre-order and registration incentives, so I don't think we can really count those, but other examples of emulation did appear as bonuses in the games themselves. Dobutsu no Mori, or Animal Forest, is one of the last games released for the N64 in Japan. A strange new concept of a communication game that at the time seemed like a gamble. Of note, a handful of Famicom games could be acquired for play in the player's house. The GameCube port, titled Dobutsu no Mori Plus, was localized as Animal Crossing for Western markets and includes several more Famicom games. These appear as NES consoles in the overseas versions and can be obtained through various means. Unfortunately, most of these don't represent the NES's finest work, consisting primarily of very early black box titles. But, you know, even if these aren't my favorite NES games, they were absolutely the most exciting items to find in the game, at least to me. One outlier to the early NES theme is Wario's Woods, possibly my favorite puzzle game of all time, which can only be found on the Game Boy Advance Link Cable Island. The GBA connection could also be used with the e-reader to acquire a couple of other games, but sadly it looks like I never ended up with those in my card packs. You could even load up the games for play on your GBA independent of your GameCube years before the classic NES series cartridges hit the system. A handful of more exciting games are hidden in Animal Crossing's code, including Punch-Out, Super Mario Bros., and The Legend of Zelda, which were reserved for Nintendo giveaways, although we've struggled to find any concrete info on this, and internet hearsay suggests that the Zelda giveaway never happened. I haven't tried it myself, but it seems like all games can be obtained through the use of a cheat device like an action replay. Now, speaking of playing NES games on the GameCube and Game Boy Advance, Nintendo made sure that no one with these systems was lacking for options to play the original Metroid. After being missing in action for a generation, Samus made her triumphant return in November 2002 with two new games. The daring first-person Metroid Prime on GameCube and the sprite-based Metroid Fusion on Game Boy Advance. Ironically, it was Metroid Prime that more closely adhered to the series formula, but after being Metroid Fusion, it's possible to unlock the original Metroid on GameCube by connecting Fusion to Prime via the link cable. Unfortunately, this version puts jump on B and shoot on A, and that just ain't right. I mean, I get why they did it, since those are the controls in Metroid Prime, but it feels real bad for an NES game. Metroid is also playable on the GBA system itself with Fusion's follow-up, Metroid Zero Mission, which is itself a reimagining of the NES original. Metroid is unlocked by simply beating Zero Mission. Of course, compromises are inevitable whenever shrinking down 240p games to the 160p GBA resolution, but no matter how you play it, the original Metroid is still fun if you can get your head in a place where you can enjoy the challenge of an open world with no in-game map. Another classic Nintendo game is included with a rather unlikely title, Fight Night Round 2 by EA Sports. To be honest, I could not figure out how to play this game at all. It just feels unresponsive to me. But you know what boxing game does feel great to play? How about we switch over to Super Punch-Out instead? Now this is more like it. 
But unfortunately, the sound emulation is some of the worst I've ever heard. Still, the game is playable enough. Super Punch-Out may not be as popular as Mike Tyson's Punch-Out among the general populace, but it's an excellent sequel that should be played any way you can get your hands on it. When Sega went third party in the early 2000s, they had a whole new audience that had never played some of their games. However, they knew they had to have some sort of hook to ease the older fans into this brave new reality. In a show of good faith, Sega added new content to many of their ports. On the GameCube, Skies of Arcadia Legends added new story content, while Sonic Adventure 2 supplemented the lengthy campaign with a new two-player battle mode. When they finally got around to the first Sonic Adventure, Sonic Team dropped in a slew of Game Gear Sonic games for players to toy with. Getting most of these unlockables is pretty easy if you just play through the main adventure normally, triggering as you hit certain emblem milestones. There's 12 games total here, giving you a complete list of portable Sonic games in one fell swoop. Sonic Adventure supports 480p, and these games tend to look pretty good. Since Game Gear games are natively 160x144, it would look a bit too narrow on a TV, so Sonic Team decided to stretch these a bit wider horizontally. Because of this, you get a bit of shimmer on the horizontal axis, but it's not too bad. Most Sonic games are so fast that you'll never even notice this. It only becomes apparent when you slow down. Outside of that, these games are generally emulated pretty well. The enormous borders have been cropped out, and the PSG sound is fairly accurately reproduced. <laughs> The only egregious issue that really stuck out to me was that Tails Adventure was insanely dark for some reason. If you go to the main option menu and switch the language to Japanese, the Game Gear ROMs will also switch over to their Japanese counterpart. That's a neat little bonus and a cool subversion of my expectations. Sonic games felt right at home on a console like the GameCube, but over on the Xbox, Sega was delivering some graphically intense sequels in the form of Jet Set Radio Feature, and more importantly, Panzer Dragoon Orda, which, I'm just saying, is my favorite game on the system. This is a game that is absolutely packed with bonus features, like artwork, minigames, and an entirely separate extra campaign. But if that wasn't enough, when you finish the main game, you can open up the entire original Panzer Dragoon, which is kind of insane, considering that it only just came out during the previous generation. The version included here is a port of the PC version instead of the Saturn original, which makes sense considering the Xbox hardware's closer relation to that environment. Whether or not this is a good thing depends on what you're looking for. A number of graphical flourishes, such as the water in the first stage, has been altered. Like the main game, it'll run at 480p if you're playing on an Xbox that supports it for this game. Although keep in mind that it has a strictly 4-3 aspect ratio, while the main Orta game supports 16x9. So don't forget to set your TV to the correct aspect ratio. But perhaps the most obvious hit against this version is the heavy filtering of the entire game, making it look really soft and blurry compared to the original. Of course, in 2002, this sort of approach was commonplace when it came to emulating or porting older games to newer hardware. The anti-dithering crowd won't mind it at all because this helps us smooth out some of the heavy dithering present, most apparent in the view cone in the HUD. Being an exclusive S-tier game on the system, it's no shock that Panzer Dragoon Orta was selected to be among the games that were made backwards compatible on not only the Xbox 360, 
but in spectacular 4K60 on the Xbox One X. Playing Orta in 4K really drives home just how timeless of a game this is. The art direction holds up extremely well, and just about every frame looks like a painting. But how does the unlockable original fare in this new version? Well, for a PC port running on an Xbox, which is in turn running on an Xbox One, it's not bad at all. No increased frame rate here. In fact, the higher resolution almost gives the impression of it being a lower frame rate than the original. But it's not glitchy or anything, at least that I've seen. The only real catch here is that it's forced to 16x9 due to the 4K upscale. Now, to be fair, this doesn't exactly destroy the integrity of the look, but considering the stellar work of Microsoft's backwards compatibility team up to this point, part of me was hoping that the proper aspect ratio would be retained. Alright, so how about Sega's arcade games? Prolific game designer Yu Suzuki included a number of his superscalar games in Shenmue that not only aided with the mid-80s immersion, but also gathered some of the most influential games of all time under one roof. Sit down and give them a shot. For 100 yen per play. Guess I'll try it. Hang On was the first superscalar game released, and while it's often overlooked in favor of its sequel, Super Hang On, its influence cannot be denied. Being present in Shenmue makes sense because Yu Suzuki directed the first game, while he only served as producer for the follow-up. Also, this is one of, if not the only officially released arcade accurate port of the original game. The other three games that appear across Shenmue are Space Harrier, Outrun, and Afterburner. These are cornerstones of Sega's arcade history that have been re-released and ported all over the place. On the Dreamcast, I was pleasantly surprised to see that Space Harrier, Outrun, and Afterburner all output at 240p although they do seem to be a touch darker and desaturated than I'd like. Still, this is pretty great if you're after something a bit more authentic. Unfortunately, Hang On seems to be 480i, and I'm not quite sure why. However, all four games do support progressive scan through a VGA box or a 480p capable cable. This will help with a lot of HDTVs, but if you have a DC HDMI mod installed in your Dreamcast, Dang, these games look razor sharp. Shenmue 2 was later ported to the original Xbox in 2002, with the same games in tow. Since the Xbox doesn't officially support 240p, all these games are forced to either 480i or 480p depending on your video output settings. The overall image has been brightened up a bit, and the audio has been tweaked to sound a bit fuller. Everything remains pretty sharp, with Hang On being a touch softer than the others. Checkpoint. But how about the Shenmue 1 and 2 HD re-release? D3T handled these remasters to decent results overall, after a healthy dose of patches. I was curious to see how well the arcade games would be emulated here. I'm assuming that both games use the same emulation in this package, because they generally look the same. However, there are certain aspects that make me unsure if that's the case. The first game puts some reverb on certain sound effects, making them sound like they're inside of a real arcade. Welcome to the family. Get ready. While these are appreciated, they don't seem to be present in the second game. Welcome to the family. Get ready. Hang On looks to be a 4x scale of the original and is ultra sharp. The others look as though they're 4.5x scales, which isn't pixel perfect, but it doesn't cause any major shimmering issues due to the Z-axis perspective. Unfortunately, none of these games are going to be playable in Shenmue 3, which is understandable, but a bummer nonetheless. Still, chances are if you're a big fan of Shenmue, then you're most likely familiar with the series that picked up and carried its torch in more ways than one. <laughs> The 
Yakuza series has resonated with gamers of all types ever since the original entry on PS2, and Sega has been more than happy to provide hungry fans with more. Now, I have to admit, the grand scale of the ongoing story has intimidated me for years. That is a lot of game to get through. So I took the 1980s prequel, Yakuza 0, as a way to give the series a taste test. While Yakuza is considered by many to be a spiritual successor to Shinmu, I prefer to liken it to River City Ransom, an open world that is equal parts serious and goofy where you beat up punks, money flows, and fast food is your never-ending source of strength. But one cue it most certainly takes from Shinmu are its Sega arcades. Famed emulation developer M2 has long handled the series' arcade titles, and I had a great time playing Space Harrier and OutRun in Yakuza 0. But other entries in the series even include games like Poyo Poyo and some of the Virtua Fighter games. The Yakuza team has a habit of sneaking classics into other games they've developed, such as Fist of the North Star, Lost Paradise, in which you can find many arcade games scattered across the wasteland. Let's ride. <gasps> Hang on! You can even use a Sega Master System in Kenshiro's apartment that plays one of the very earliest Fist of the North Star video games. This is the first time that this version has been released outside Japan with the Fist of the North Star license. It was previously localized as Black Belt and was quite a different game. I just love how the enemies explode. The technical wizards from German-American development studio Factor 5 built their brand on the Turrican franchise, but rose to higher prominence with their technically impressive and critically acclaimed Star Wars titles for N64, PC, and GameCube. Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader was a miracle of a third-party launch title for the GameCube, and included both the battles of Yavin and Endor, leaving few ideas for a potential sequel. As such, Rogue Squadron 3 Rebel Strike was released in 2003 to a more tepid reception that was further marred by unimpressive on-foot gameplay. Nonetheless, Rebel Strike offers a trio of enticing bonuses, emulations of the classic Star Wars arcade games. Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back are unlocked through normal progression in the game's main missions. Both were originally designed for vector monitors, so 480p on the GameCube can't really replicate the true look. It's a bit dark. But still, this is a convenient way to play these impressive early 3D titles. Prepare to make the jump to light speed. I want that shit. Do not excuse The Return of the Jedi arcade game is unlocked by entering a password. Here goes nothing. I locked onto the strongest power source. It should be the power generator. Rampage Total Destruction was developed by Foundation 9 and released for the PlayStation 2, GameCube, and Wii in 2006. This is a polygon based interpretation of Midway's classic Rampage series, and like its predecessors, there's not much to it. But if you're looking to shut off your brain and indulge in some mindless mayhem, you could certainly do worse. But if you prefer the older titles, Total Destruction also offers emulations of the original Rampage and Rampage World Tour. Fittingly, the emulation is handled by Digital Eclipse, which was at the time a part of Foundation 9. The first game is a slow-paced 1986 arcade title, while World Tour is a much faster game, which I definitely prefer. The scaling is far from perfect, although in the case of World Tour, the graphics' general softness seems to prevent visible shimmering. Certain elements of the graphics of both games appear to be drawn at a higher resolution, so I wanted to see what would happen if I forced 480p using the GameCube homebrew utility Swiss. Interestingly, booting each game from the title menu after forcing 480p resets the output to 480i. But Swiss can also directly access two other boot launchers on the disc, both of which display an extremely interesting list of games. 
Unfortunately, none of them actually load aside from the Rampage titles, but booting from this menu was the only way I was able to use 480p with the arcade titles, at least on GameCube. Contra 4 by Way Forward is perhaps the best action game for the Nintendo DS. A supremely satisfying running gun from a team that simply knows how to make a game that looks, sounds, and plays as Contra should. <music> Fittingly, two of the NES classics that inspired Contra 4 are included as unlockables for clearing missions in the game's challenge mode. The NES version of Contra is one of the best 8-bit games ever made, and while there are some noticeable audio hiccups and neither of the scaling options available can really make up for the DS's screen being a bit too low res for NES games, the fact that this game was included at all ended up being quite significant. That's because following Contra 4, Konami failed to re-release the NES Contra on any of Nintendo's virtual console platforms or even the NES Classic Edition and its scarcity on modern platforms has been a real shame. It wasn't until the Contra Anniversary Collection that the game finally re-emerged. Contra 4 also includes the NES version of Super C, a solid sequel that's just a bit less classic. This is the game that Konami has consistently used to represent the series' NES era on Virtual Console and on the NES Classic Edition in lieu of Contra 1, which has probably made some fans a bit bitter. But in spite of imperfect emulation, NES games being playable on the DS was a nice novelty in 2007. When it comes to packing games full of extras, one developer that immediately comes to mind is Namco. Especially during the PlayStation 1 and 2 eras, they really set a standard for unlockables that has perhaps never quite been matched since. I already mentioned Panzer Dragoon Orta's crazy list of unlockable content earlier in the episode, but when it comes to sheer amount of bonus material, no developer delivered more consistently than Namco on the PlayStation 1 and 2. Ridge Racer was the first game that gave Sega a real challenger when it came to racing game dominance. In a sign of things to come, the PS1 featured a mini version of Namco's arcade classic, Galaxian, as a way to help players pass the time during load screens. Before the development of Ridge Racer Type 4, the team behind it did extensive research on just how viable 480i 60 frames per second would be for a new game. Although the PS1 version of Tekken 3 was able to achieve this, R4 was just going to be too much for the hardware. Instead of letting this research go to waste, they put the tech to good use in an enhanced version of the first game called Ridge Racer Turbo Mode. With R4 being the final entry on the PlayStation 1, Namco included Turbo Mode on a bonus disc in the same package, putting a nice bow on the first generation of Ridge Racer. The higher res makes it look especially crisp on a CRT, and the higher frame rate is immediately apparent. What's cool is they also included a pared down version of the original non-Turbo Ridge Racer on the same disc, so you can observe just how far development improved over the system's lifespan. Tekken 5 arrived on the PlayStation 2 in 2005, just in time to celebrate the series' 10th anniversary. In order to put a cap on the series that was always pushing the PlayStation hardware, Namco went all out with the bonus content here. Taking a cue from the PS1 release of Ridge Racer, you can play an arcade game during the loading screen. This time, it's the 1991 first-person rail shooter, Starblade. While the loading screen just gives you a taste of battle, the entire game can be unlocked and is playable in the arcade history section. Believe it or not, this was the first time that an arcade-accurate version of Starblade made its way to home consoles. 
There were other versions on the Sega CD and other disc-based consoles, but nothing remotely as close as this. Filling out the rest of Tekken 5's arcade history is not only the arcade version of Tekken 1, but Tekken 2 and Tekken 3. Although I'm sure that some fans were sad that they're the arcade versions and not the PS1 ports, but come on, this is an insane lineup here. Round one, fight! fight. The first two games even display at an accurate 240p, while Tekken 3 is obviously at 480i like it should be. Although I'm not super experienced with these games, I feel like they run exceptionally well here. The level of care that went into representing and preserving these versions is admirable and fills out a great package, both when it was released and now. But on the other side of the coin, you've got something like this. Back in 1989, Konami struck gold with their four-player Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles arcade game. So when Konami got the license back in 2003 to make games based around the then-recent cartoon reboot, I was excited to see what they'd do with it, even though I had no interest with the show. Three new games followed, and to say these didn't live up to expectations would be an understatement. But there was a silver lining. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 Battle Nexus had the original 1989 arcade game as an unlockable, hopefully giving me an arcade perfect version at home that I'd always dreamed of. While this version looks and plays about how I'd expect for 2004, the real problem lies in the audio. Due to licensing issues, all the voices have been removed, which I suppose does make sense. But the music is all gone too. They replaced it all with a single music track that is used on every single level. And it's horrible. It just doesn't work at all for this version of the game. The combination of the removed voices and replaced music absolutely decimates the experience of this game, making it feel oddly empty and lifeless. The following year, Konami bundled Turtles 2, Turtles in Time as a bonus with TMNT 3, Mutant Nightmare, which fares significantly better. But because the Super NES version of Turtles in Time is so good, if not better than the arcade, the allure of owning this version isn't quite as strong. It doesn't have the original soundtrack, but at least each stage has different, more appropriate music. Voices are also changed, but it seems to be a re-recording of the same lines, although the acting quality is exceptionally bad. <laughs> hey Krang, bring that statue back, you bloated beanbag! Hey Krang, bring that statue back, you bloated beanbag! Both of these turtle games are, disappointingly, 480i only, even on the Xbox. Forcing the 480p using GSM on the PlayStation 2 does work and naturally looks much better. I didn't have the GameCube version on hand to test with Swiss, but I would expect similar results. When I graduated high school, I spent a few years working for Electronics Boutique. While I was busy enjoying Castlevania Symphony of the Night and Final Fantasy VII, a coworker was obsessed with getting the most out of his PC and 3D accelerator cards to get the best possible experience playing Quake 2. His enthusiasm eventually rubbed off on me, 
and suddenly I was spending way too much money upgrading my computer with a Voodoo 3 so that I could play, you guessed it, Quake 2. Years later, I had an itch to revisit Quake 2, and after searching for ways to play on newer hardware, I discovered that there was a little-known Xbox 360 port bundled with the special edition of Quake 4 from around when the console launched in 2005. As it turns out, this is a pretty amazing version of the game, and is self-contained on its own DVD to boot. In a paper sleeve, sure, but I'll take it. And get this, not only is this version in 1080p, but it also runs at 60 frames per second, which isn't even something that the Xbox 360 really had the ability to do until years after release. It's gorgeous, silky smooth, and never seems to drop frames or slow down at all. These days, it's refreshing to play a first-person shooter driven by simplicity. No melee attacks, kill streaks, or even having the reload. Revisiting Quake 2 has been a complete joy. Of course, some people will find the idea of playing Quake 2 with a controller absolutely blasphemous. There was a time when I'd be right there along with them. But the fact is, I don't have the patience or the desire to sit at my PC and play games with a mouse and keyboard these days. And get this, there's even an option for networking and split-screen deathmatch for up to 8 players. I don't have anybody to play it with, but it's pretty cool that they put that in there. So sure, Quake 2 was around 8 years old by the time that the Xbox 360 version released, but to think that this optimized console version has been available for almost 15 years now makes me feel silly for not finding it sooner. So while a classic game being included as a bonus with another doesn't always guarantee a home run, it's always interesting to see the adjustments or concessions that developers had to make. While this is obviously just a small sampling of games within games that have been released over the years, there's a ton of notable ones that we'd feel silly for not mentioning. So maybe we need to return to this subject in the future. Do you remember going on a family vacation as a kid? In the mid-80s, I spent most of my gaming time in the back seat with Tiger Electronic handhelds. They weren't exactly amazing, but, you know, they worked. Once Nintendo's Game Boy and the Atari Lynx hit in 1989 with their interchangeable cartridges, well, now we're talking. The Sega Game Gear wasn't far behind, and suddenly, those car trips weren't so bad. But with that came another conundrum. What games do you bring along with you? But think about this. What if you could take every single game for a console on the road with you in the form of a single cartridge? Talk about a childhood dream, right? In this episode, we're going to take a look at EverDrives for portable game systems. If you're a vintage gaming enthusiast, then there's probably a good chance you've heard of EverDrives by now. Designed by a Ukrainian hardware designer known as Crix, EverDrives are cartridges for various systems that allow you to load ROMs from SD cards. I previously covered EverDrives for home consoles, but this time we're focusing on those available for handheld systems. While there are many ways to play ROMs and hacks via software emulation, PSP Homebrew being a especially popular method for portable games, the appeal of flashcards is playing those games on their original hardware. Of course, EverDrives are not the only flashcards in town. Retro HQ has made flashcards for other portable consoles like the Atari Lynx and the Neo Geo Pocket Color. And of course, we have to acknowledge the options available for the Nintendo DS and more. Needless to say, I'd certainly like to take a look at those in the future, but for now I'm going to have to focus on the ones that I have on hand here. 
Setting up each EverDrive is a fairly standard procedure. First, download the operating system file from Cricks.com and copy it, along with whatever ROM files you may have on hand, to a FAT32 formatted SD card. Insert that card into the slot, plug in the cart, and hit the power and voila! You can choose from any game using a simple text-based menu. Selecting one will load the ROM into the EverDrive's memory, and the console will play it as if it was the actual cartridge. Playing ROMs in this fashion may call into question the morality of it all. For me, I appreciate a game more if I've paid for it, and I'll probably put in the time to finish it. When you have every game for a system at the touch of a button, there's a good chance that you're not going to dedicate the time to any one game that it deserves. On the other hand, an EverDrive is especially helpful for the overall production of My Life in Gaming. And homebrew games give another dimension to its usefulness, especially since we prefer to capture from original hardware whenever possible. EverDrives can be purchased directly from Cricks at Cricks.com or through Stone Age Gamer at StoneAgeGamer.com. The EverDrives covered in this episode were sent to us by both Stone Age Gamer and Cricks so that we could evaluate them for this episode. Before we dive in, we should very briefly touch on flash memory voltage and how it applies to EverDrives. Back in July of 2017, there was a bit of a tizzy around a blog post by DB Electronics who took a closer look at the memory voltage of certain flash and reproduction cards. He determined that a number of these operate at a lower voltage that is out of specification levels for the original consoles. The extra voltage is dissipated as heat on the cartridge side, which could cause a bit of additional wear and tear to the hardware, and some EverDrive models fell into this category. This is generally not a concern for portable EverDrives. Out of all the EverDrives we'll be covering in this episode, the only one that is out of spec to the system's cartridge bus is the Game Gear EverDrive. There's been a lot of debate over whether it's a serious concern to begin with, so just use your best judgment. We do recommend avoiding some of the cheaper, Chinese-made knockoff flash and multi-cards. They're not usually electronically sound and are considered risky to use. For a complete breakdown of which EverDrives could pose long-term issues, check out the DB Electronics site. When the Game Boy launched in 1989, the world had no idea the kind of impact it would have over the next 10 years. Selling over 118 million units in its lifetime, it's safe to say that the original Game Boy, the Game Boy Pocket, and the Game Boy Color are among the most beloved systems in history. After years of service, the line of EverDrives for the Game Boy saw an update in 2017, bringing them more in line with the other Crix products. By dividing the lineup into three tiers, X3, X5, and X7, consumers could pick the model that most reflected their needs. I'm using an X7 model for this episode, but for a full breakdown of what each version offers, check out the handy comparison list on StoneAgeGamer.com. The EverDrive GB is compatible with all units that play original Game Boy games. Of course, you won't be able to boot Game Boy Color games if you're playing on an original Game Boy Brick, Game Boy Pocket, or using the Super Game Boy or Super Game Boy 2 on the Super NES. If you're using a Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, or Game Boy Player for the GameCube, then you'll be able to load everything available for both systems. The X7 is a fully featured EverDrive and costs just under $130. The additional cost goes into hardware allowing for a real-time clock for the Pokemon fans out there, and an in-game menu that enables save states. All models use micro SD cards for storage and should be formatted to FAT32. Choosing a game from the menu brings up a few options. Select and Start will immediately load the game into memory and boot it up. Select loads your game into memory but keeps you in the menu and allows you to make use of the next option. Cheats allow you to apply Game Genie codes to the ROM in memory. Finally, ROM info is pretty self-explanatory. This details information such as size and, hey, mapper. Like the NES before it, many Game Boy games use special hardware to enhance certain games. A mapper would tell the system how to access and use this hardware, which oftentimes resulted in some neat tricks. A number of mappers were used during the Game Boy's lifetime, and the most popular ones are fully supported here. If you press select on the main EverDrive menu, you're brought to the options menu. Here you can make some tweaks to the functionality, such as enabling cheats, adjusting the real-time clock, or pick one of your most recently played games. Or, if you're feeling indecisive, hit the random game option and go to town. 
Games themselves load pretty quick, but it's not quite instantaneous. That's yeah, a little bit longer than I thought. I've spent quite a bit of time picking random games and I haven't run into any real issues at all. Although it's completely possible that I just got lucky, I feel that the EverDrive hardware is mature enough to work with most ROMs at this point. One thing to keep in mind is if you play an original Game Boy game on color-capable hardware, you'll have to set your color palette every time you boot up a game. Not a problem if you like the default palette, but if you like using regular old boring black and white like me, don't forget to hold down the B button and press left on the D-pad during boot up. One of the nicest convenience of modern game emulation is the creation and loading of save states. If you can't quite make it past a section of a game or you suddenly have to stop playing, being able to save, quit, and resume at a later time is invaluable. Heck, even Nintendo's own virtual console on the 3DS incorporates this feature. So perhaps it goes without saying, but the addition of save states on the X7 is a killer upgrade over the X3 and X5. That said, how to access this feature took me far longer to figure out than I'd like to admit. I assumed that it was accessed using a button combination much like the in-game menu of the Mega EverDrive for the Sega Genesis. I tried everything, but I simply couldn't get it to work. Turns out it's much simpler than that, but it was a little obtuse to figure out. On the center of the PCB, there's a button that can be activated if you push in on the center of the cartridge shell. Doing so pauses the game and brings up the in-game menu, where you can save, load, and return to the main menu. The in-game menu may not work in certain games, although the only ones I personally ran into was Battletoads and Ragnarok's world. I'm sure there's more, so don't freak out if the button does nothing. Not everything is perfect with save states though. Saving and loading does work fairly quickly, but sometimes the sound and music may not play correctly upon loading your state. Now that I think about it, I'm not really sure if it could be done any other way. It's a super convenient feature for portable games made before a sleep function was built into the hardware itself. In addition to the Game Boy and Game Boy Color's huge game libraries, a number of ROM hacks and fan translations have been created over time. Here's some stuff that I recommend you should check out. Game Gear was Sega's entry into the portable market. Armed with a full-color screen, it was poised to deal a fatal blow to the Game Boy and AA batteries everywhere. But as we know, it didn't quite work out that way. But that's not to say that it didn't have its fair share of great games. At first, the EverDrive GG, along with its $90 price tag, might not seem like the greatest value proposition. A smallish game library puts it firmly in the non-essential category. But if you take a look at some of the console's innate abilities, it might suddenly become a bit more interesting to you. I found it kind of odd that the form factor of the cart itself is unlike other EverDrives in that it doesn't have an external SD card slot. You have to physically open up the cartridge shell to insert the micro SD card. 
It is pretty much a one and done situation though, because you can fit the entire library on a two gig card with tons of space to spare. There is no built-in sorting when it comes to the EverDrive GG's operating system, so directories and ROMs may appear out of order. You might want to use a program like DriveSort to make things look nice and tidy. Launching a game does take significantly longer due to the older tech used in this EverDrive in particular. Alright, on to compatibility. The EverDrive GG boasts just about 100% game support, and I didn't really run into many reasons to doubt this claim. Of course, it's the games that are outside of that near 100% that we're probably the most interested in. The most unfortunate game under this umbrella is the Game Gear version of Gunstar Heroes. This is pretty much a bummer. It's completely unplayable with tons of graphical corruption and random resets. It's worth noting that games with battery backup will save directly to the SD card, so there's really no reason to hesitate playing RPGs at all. So check out the Shining Force games if you're a fan of the series. For me, I was finally able to give Fantasy Star Gaiden a spin thanks to the fan translation. As you may or may not know, the Game Gear is an evolution of the Sega Master System. It's so similar that a cartridge pass-through device called the Master Gear was released, allowing you to play Master System cartridges directly on a Game Gear. Upon detecting an SMS game, the system kicks into Master System compatibility mode to play the game, which means... Master System ROMs will also run on the EverDrive GG. It's as simple as loading ROMs with the .sms file extension. In fact, you can even load ROMs of games that were released on the Sega card format. The only real downside to SMS games on the Game Gear is that the sprites and in-game objects tend to be a bit smaller because they're a higher resolution and meant for a larger CRT television. Most of the time when games were ported to the Game Gear, they'd zoom in on the action, sacrificing playing field size for larger sprites. There were times when both the Game Gear and Master System versions of a game contained the same ROM. For instance, Castle of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse is essentially a Master System game on a Game Gear cartridge. The game plays in SMS compatibility mode. And yes, it works just fine. As a quick tangent, if you have a Game Gear equipped with a video output mod, which is part of the Mick Will LCD screen mod that Jason from Game Tech US put in my system, then Master System games will appear in their native resolution when connected to an external display. On a CRT, games that use Master System mode will fill the screen, while native Game Gear titles only use a portion of the screen. Before we get too carried away, there are of course some limitations regarding Master System games. If you play a Super Scope 3D game, there's just no way to connect the 3D glasses. Naturally, light phaser games are also unplayable due to the display technology needed. Finally, support for Sega SG-1000 games was added in a more recent OS update, but unfortunately, game compatibility seems to be a bit hit or miss, at least with the ROM set I was using. Too bad, I was looking forward to spending some time with Dragon Wang on the go, but the palette seems to be a bit busted. Sorry, Dragon Wang. If you're a fan of the Game Gear and Master System, the EverDrive GG is well worth it. If you have a Game Gear capable of TV output, then the value increases significantly. I suppose it's worth noting that the EverDrive GG is perhaps the only one that hasn't received an update or refresh in the last several years, so it's possible there could be one right around the corner. In addition to the previously mentioned Fantasy Star Gaiden, here's some other goodies that I think you should try out. The much-anticipated follow-up to the Game Boy Color arrived in 2001, putting power in your pocket to rival the Super NES, 
The Game Boy Advance may just be the best portable console ever made, and it has a game library to prove it. The EverDrive GBA X5 arrived in 2016 amid much anticipation. Despite the X5 label, at the time of this video, no X3 or X7 models exist. It runs around $100 and uses micro SD cards. The first thing that probably caught your eye might have been the slightly out of spec form factor. Yes, it's a bit bigger than a typical GBA card, more akin to a Yoshi Topsy Turvy cartridge. There's a lot going on inside this thing, so its larger size does make a lot of sense. All the same, it works quite nicely with the different ways there are to play Game Boy Advance titles. The original Game Boy Advance, the GBA SP, the Game Boy Advance Micro, and yeah, it also works when inserted into a GBA slot on a Nintendo DS and DS Lite. Heck, it even works with the Visteon GBA player. It's probably not too much of a stretch to believe that it will work with the Game Boy player on the GameCube too. Well, just to confirm, it does, using both the official software disc and the Game Boy interface if you're looking for some of that 240p goodness. At this point, you know what to expect when it comes to the OS. The functionality is pretty close to what we've seen with the EverDrive GB. Games boot up super quickly, but if you want to speed it up even more, turn on Quick Boot in the options and it'll bypass the good old GBA boot screen. I guess this might cause some compatibility issues with certain games, so I feel like the second save probably isn't worth the hassle. The EverDrive GBA claims to work with nearly 100% of games, although incompatibility is oftentimes comes down to a lack of special hardware required. Games like Boktai will load, but will ultimately be unplayable due to not having a solar sensor available. In many instances, ROM hacks have been devised that attribute these gameplay mechanics to a button combination. Hey, it's not the way these games were meant to be played, but I do appreciate these workarounds. However, in some cases, solutions to hardware-based problems are already integrated into the unit. Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, for instance, use a real-time clock to enhance gameplay and are already accounted for in the OS. There were a bunch of GBA video cartridges that were released in the later years of the console's life that had full episodes of shows on them. At this point in time, certain titles are unsupported due to the file size of the video. In general though, I don't think it's too huge of a loss outside of the novelty of the format. With these limitations in mind, feel free to dive in and see what the GBA library has to offer. The system has a glowing reputation for a reason. The Game Boy Line has always been renowned for its support of previous platforms, and you'd expect the GBA EverDrive to take advantage of that ability. Well, surprisingly, that isn't exactly the case, and there's no native support for non-GBA games. The big reason for this is because of a physical switch inside of the cartridge slot that needs to be pushed down to enable Game Boy compatibility mode. Of course, Crix knew this would be an issue, and over time devised a workaround that uses a third-party emulator called Goomba. This was kind of surprising seeing that an EverDrive's primary allure is playing ROMs on real hardware for an authentic experience. So you're going to need an EverDrive GB if that's really important to you. Just put the emulator file in the system folder and you can boot Game Boy and Game Boy Color ROMs just fine. Being that it is emulation, you might run into some instances of bugs and glitches that aren't present with pure hardware functionality. However, games do run in a pixel-accurate one-to-one mode, so they do a good job of approximating a true experience overall. Interestingly, Goomba isn't the only emulator that the X5 is capable of using. As of firmware 1.11, you can also play NES, Master System, and Sega Game Gear ROMs using accompanying emulators. These additional emulators are a fun novelty, but all run with a number of inaccuracies. The NES and Sega Master System games are scaled and stretched to fill the screen, which makes text and other graphical flourishes look all wrong. The sound on Master System games is especially atrocious. Each of these emulators have a few options and tweaks that can be accessed by hitting L and R while in a game. Doing this lets you toggle through available color palettes and more odds and ends.
Because it's an X5 model, surely Crix has some ideas for an X7 up his sleeve. Maybe native Game Boy and Game Boy Color support via physical switch? Save states seem to be a normal feature of X7 Everdrives as well, so I'm sure they'd be included. The Game Boy Advance's library was pretty staggering, and there was a whole bunch of stuff that was never released in the US. Here's some stuff I think you should definitely check out. These handy little devices can put a console's game library, along with excellent fan translations, homebrews, and hacks into the palm of your hands. This is especially true with portable EverDrives, since you can take the console and its games with you anywhere. If you ask me, this might just be the absolute best use of flashcard technology. It just makes sense. Having all your games on one cart is a dream. Unless, of course, you're also nostalgic for carrying around all your games and accessories like this kit. If you have any interest in vintage gaming, you've surely noticed how prices in the used game market have skyrocketed to a stupid degree over the last year. For newcomers or people who just want a quick hit of nostalgia, the price of entry can be scary and straight up annoying. It's no wonder that interest in flashcards and ODEs, which make it possible to play game ROMs or disk image files off an SD card on real console hardware, are becoming increasingly more appealing to just about anyone involved in the hobby. These indispensable devices provide a convenient and fairly authentic way of exploring a system's library. After releasing the Mega SD, a flashcard for the Sega Genesis and Mega Drive, which had Sega CD-ROM support, and the Mode, an optical drive emulator for the Saturn, Dreamcast, and PlayStation 1, Terra Onion returns to update one of their most popular devices, the Super SD System 3 for the PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16. This is the Super HD System 3 Pro, and let's see if it's worth upgrading. When the Super SD System 3 was first announced back in 2018, the excitement surrounding it was palpable. Here is a device that connects to the back of your PC Engine, TurboGrafx-16, or SuperGrafx that lets you load just about any game for the system without needing a CD-ROM add-on, all while passing through RGB video output via a Genesis 2 style DIN. Outside of SuperGrafx game support, which was only still possible if you're connected to a SuperGrafx console, this was possibly the most robust flashcard style device that had come along yet, and it was a real dream come true for fans and newcomers alike. Unfortunately, the first couple of revisions were hindered by various technical issues related to the video output specifically. Some of these flaws were fixed via firmware updates, while the more egregious problems needed full-on hardware modifications. After a final revision that incorporated these fixes at a base hardware level, Terra Onion then moved on to other projects, the Mega SD, and the Mode, multi-optical disc emulator. Both are robust devices in their own right, but they also don't need to bother with video output. In fall of 2020, the Super SD System 3 received a firmware update that streamlined the menu interface to align with the Mega SD and Mode. This was a pleasant surprise, since the old menu setup was starting to look slightly antiquated. Everyone was curious what Terra Onion's next device was gonna be, and when they began to tease an announcement in spring of 2021, speculation went into overdrive. I don't think anyone expected the Super HD System 3 Pro, 
an updated version of the Super SD System 3 that features an enhanced FPGA, super graphics support for all consoles, and HDMI output. All this comes at a price of around $320 US dollars, making it nearly $100 more than the Super SD System 3, which received a price drop a while back. As the Super HD Pro began to reach consumers' hands in July of 2021, Terra Onion asked if I wanted to take a look and see if it was worth the upgrade. So they sent over a review unit, and here we are. From a purely aesthetic point of view, the major differences between the original and the new device is the blue-colored plastic and the AV port plate which now has openings for an HDMI cable, a micro USB for developers, and a physical reset button, in addition to the previous Genesis 2 style DIN for analog video output. The micro SD slot is still tricky to access, requiring long fingernails or a pair of tweezers to get the card in and out. The device slides onto the back of the console, connecting to the pinouts on the back. As before, it's tough to get it just right on a TurboGrafx-16 console, so you might need to loosen the screws a bit to get it on. But this might also cause things to not line up perfectly, and some pins might get bent. Because of this, and it's something that I didn't realize about the original Super SD3, is that it's not officially supported. Yeah, it'll work identically once connected, so just remember to be careful when putting it on there, okay? The real differences are under the hood, thanks to a more powerful FPGA, as well as experience built up during the development of the Mega SD and mode, the team at Terra Onion were able to completely rethink and evolve their previous approach for this new version. Once you boot up the system, you're met with a newly designed menu that's about as straightforward as these things can be. Different color themes can be used to change the window dressing to match your console of choice, while a new cover art browser can be activated with the help of a database file if you want a more complete look. It does get a slight resolution bump when using the built-in HDMI output though. Game ROM and disk images are stored on an XFAT or FAT32 formatted micro SD card in whatever directory hierarchy works for you. CD-ROM games do need all of their relevant files placed within their own folder on a per-game basis though. That folder name is what the menu will see as the game. So look, this is an update to the Super SD System 3, a device which I covered pretty handily back in 2018. As much as I'd prefer to only spend my time looking at the newer features, let's do a quick overview of the essential features of the Super HD System 3 Pro. First off, it's important to point out the way that Terra Onion handles firmware updates has not been changed. New firmware updates are downloadable from a portal on their website and requires you to register your device's serial number to an account, and those firmware updates are tied directly to that serial number. Some people might not care about this process, but others could understandably have an aversion to this method of dealing with updates. Hue cards, or turbo chips if you prefer, work just as good as they did before. This is a given since you're using the original console's hardware to play them. On the other hand, CD-ROM games rely on the FPGA, which is emulating the Super CD-ROM hardware. As a result, the potential for incompatibilities and glitches is much greater. If you do run into issues, you might just need to toggle the Seek Time Emulation setting in the menu so that the hardware reads the data as if it was a 1x CD-ROM drive. If all else fails, give the alternate CD-ROM program a try, which emulates a different set of CD-ROM hardware. This fixed an issue I ran into where the Adams Family would hang after the intro, preventing you from being able to play this incredibly well-made game. But sometimes, a game is just busted and there's no way to get it working perfectly right now, such as with Sherlock Holmes Volume 2's FMV audio being out of sync, which was also a problem on the original SD system. You see it in the paper every day. Thankfully, we have the London Times to keep us informed of all these troubling activities with an unbiased eye. But in some cases, it's even possible that an incompatibility or glitch could simply stem from certain game and BIOS combinations. An update to the in-game trigger, where you can jump back to the Super HD menu when you hold down select and run for several seconds, has supposedly been made to work better. Although, I never really had much of an issue with it before. If you do run into circumstances where this doesn't work at all, a new physical button on the back of the Super HD will reset the game or return to the menu. As someone who cares way too much about their save files, the per-game backup RAM is one of my favorite features of the Super SD System 3 and, by proxy, the Super HD System 3. Keeping this setting activated will create an empty pool of backup RAM for each game that supports save files, so space concerns will never become a major issue. Not to mention that it's easy to backup and share your saves for future generations. 
The inclusion of Super Graphics game support is a top tier feature and something that people wish that the Super SD System 3 could do when it was originally released. The high price of buying Super Graphics hardware, combined with its minuscule library of exclusive games, generally isn't worth the price of entry for most. Being able to play through these games on a PC Engine or TurboGrafx-16 is a big win for those who don't want to shell out for the industrial looking piece of hardware. But what about those of you who already have a Super Graphics system? Like me? Well, here's where we run into a slight conundrum. You see, using the Super HD System 3 on a Super Graphics console might break compatibility with Super Graphics games. Weird, right? This wasn't an issue on the Super SD System 3. So, what's the deal? Most of the Super Graphics extra power comes from a second visual display controller, or VDC, which handles additional sprites and background layers. The Super SD System 3 outputs the analog video that was passed to it from the system, and in the case of a Super Graphics, both original hardware VDCs would generate the graphics in tandem and send it out via the analog pins. The spark plug and engine block AV work the same way. The Super HD System 3 does things a bit differently though, and this is important. All PC Engine consoles with the external port have a number of pins that are tied to a digital video signal. The Super HD System 3 reconstructs the video from these digital pin outs to give us exceptional looking video over either analog or HDMI. But the problem with the Super Graphics is that the second VDC doesn't have corresponding digital pins, which means that the Super HD System 3 doesn't have all the information to work with. So instead, it emulates the second VDC on the FPGA. And this is how these games are able to be played on a regular old PC engine. But on a Super Graphics system, it causes major graphical glitches. Now, sure, you can sidestep the issue by flipping the PC Engine mode compatibility switch on the Super Graphics system, but then you're not even using the system's additional hardware. So what's even the point? Even then, while Super Graphics games run fairly well, they're certainly not flawless. Take 1941, for example. Look how the destructible portions of the cliff on Stage 2 are slightly separated on the Super HD, while it's totally fine on the Super SD. I guess what I'm trying to say is, if you're a Super Graphics owner, I think that you'll find that the Super SD System 3 offers a much more authentic experience. One of the touted features of the more powerful FPGA is the ability to run different cores on it. Think something like the Mister, where the FPGA emulates different consoles. As it stands right now, an NES core has been teased, but neither that or any other cores are available, so I can't really comment on this feature. But I can make a note that the PC Engine conversions of some NES games, like Mega Man 2, do run just fine on the Super HD system. But let's jump back for a minute. What was all that about digital pinouts? Well, that's sort of a big thing with the Super HD System 3 Pro. So let's look at the different audio and video options, as well as seeing what that HDMI output is all about. Super HD system outputs analog composite, RGB, and component video via a Genesis 2 style DIN plug, while the HDMI output offers 640x480, 480p, or 720p. While the Super HD System 3 is tapping the digital pins to rebuild the video image, this isn't the same as how, say, the PS1 or N64 digital mods work. So just be sure to level your expectations. If HDMI output is the main hook for you, it looks really great, if you don't mind being limited to 720p. Of the three resolutions supported over HDMI, 720p is likely the one that generates the most interest, not just because it's the highest, but also because when combined with the sharp filtering option, you get an integer scale of all the system's different resolutions evenly within the frame. With 640x480 and 480p, you might run into some shimmer if a game's resolution can't be evenly scaled within the frame. If you feel that a game looks too wide when integer scaled in 720p, try out the smooth scaling mode, which also corrects the aspect ratio since the slightly blurred image will also hide the shimmer. The requisite scanline modes do a good job of approximating the overall feel of a CRT, but in a time when various mods and upscaling devices are going absolutely buck wild with scanline and overlay options, there's just not a lot to be excited about here. Like most older consoles, the PC Engine doesn't output frames exactly to the NTSC spec, 
so buffered video is required to ensure greater screen compatibility. This buffered mode gives us around one frame of lag across the main trio of HDMI resolutions. However, there is an unbuffered, nearly zero lag 480p mode. But all the displays I tried it on haven't liked this mode at all and haven't worked. The analog video output quality seems to be a minor step up from the Super SD system, which I felt looked really good by the final revision of that hardware anyway. Depending on what type of cable you're using with the analog connection, you want to adjust the analog brightness setting. Normal brightness is fine for RGB, but if you got some of them HD Retrovision cables, set this to medium and turn the brightness switch off. Speaking of cables, the analog video seems to generate a weird ghosting effect that's reminiscent of what happens with the C11 capacitor on the Super NES Junior systems. The degree to which anyone will ever notice this will vary, and it only became apparent to me when walking past the clouds at the end of the intro stage in Bonk's Revenge. In testing various scenarios, this seems to be always present when using an RGB cable, but can be eliminated with using the HD Retrovision cables and adjusting the low-pass filter on your upscaler of choice. On a CRT, it's virtually invisible. Depending on the equipment you already have integrated into your gaming setup, using the analog signal with an external scaler like the OSSC or RetroTINK 5X gives you greater control of the image without limiting you to 720p. But then, you might have to deal with the ghosting. Making the situation more complex is that the Super SD system doesn't seem to exhibit any sort of ghosting artifacts no matter what cable you use, and neither do any of the other popular analog options, such as the spark plug and the engine block AV. So I suppose it could be argued that if you're an analog purist, the Super SD system might be the superior choice to get your PC Engine ODE fix. The biggest letdown for me is that the Super HD cannot output video over analog and HDMI simultaneously. I'm sure there's numerous reasons this wasn't possible, but this would have gone a long way to qualifying the device as an essential upgrade. So if you're looking to play on a CRT while recording or live streaming gameplay in HD via HDMI, then I'm afraid you're going to have to look to other methods. If you ask me, perhaps the most exciting and interesting feature of the Super HD System 3 is the use of different color tables, or palettes. Up until recently, all the different PC Engine video mods, emulators, and FPGA implementations have used linearly mapped RGB color values. For the most part, this looks totally fine, but when compared side by side with the PC Engine's composite video in certain games, suddenly it becomes clear that something is amiss. The example everyone likes to cite is a battle scene from Startling Odyssey 2, where one of the gradients in the sky seems to be completely missing in RGB. Thanks to the hard work, research, and testing by a team of dedicated PC Engine fans, a composite palette has been developed that adjusts certain color values to bring it more in line with composite video. Until now, this palette has only been officially implemented in the Mr. FPGA's Turbo Duo Core. But thanks to the Super HD System 3's palette feature, you can now load it on real hardware. Just drop the .pal file into the palettes folder inside of the sys folder on the SD card. Go to the color table and video options and it will show up there. Of course, if you prefer the linear RGB palette, just stick with the default setting. And finally, we haven't really touched on the audio side of things yet. The original Super SD System 3 didn't recreate totally accurate audio, but to my ear, I didn't think it was all that bad. But now, thanks to MD Fourier, an incredible tool for analyzing console sound, Terra Onion could dial in the Super HD 3's audio to skew closer to a real console. There's a significant difference in audio levels between HDMI and analog output, with no room for adjustment. I've been told that boosting the audio levels on the analog side would cause distortion in the audio. That's really unfortunate. But how close did they get to real hardware through the use of MD Fourier? Here, take a listen and judge for yourself.
So where does this leave us with the Super HD System 3 Pro? Well, it's definitely not a clear-cut decision. Although I absolutely applaud Terra Onion for having the forethought to include the composite color palette, as well as using MD Fourier to adjust the audio, I'm not sure if this upgrade was necessary right now. Of course, the creation of this new version could have to do with any number of circumstances, such as the worldwide chip shortage that's going on right now. The landscape of the vintage gaming scene is in a constant flux right now. So the arrival of the Super HD System 3 Pro is a prime example of how hard it can be to iterate upon an already fully featured device. For those who have never bought the Super SC System 3, this is a great place to jump in. But it's tough to justify an upgrade if you still have the original version. Fact is, there's valid reasons to want either version in your gaming setup. So as much as I hate to say it, you're just gonna have to decide what's right for your particular situation. A couple of years back, I had a lot of fun sharing ROM hacks that I found to be useful and interesting. I vastly prefer hacks that fix bugs, streamline certain annoyances, and improve upon the overall experience. I think of them as having a more utilitarian purpose versus, say, some level of ridiculous like this. I thought it might be time to revisit the scene and share some of the bountiful spoils that have been showered upon us over the last several years, as well as shine a light on several that I missed the last go around. So let's once again check out some useful ROM hacks. ROM hacking scene is booming. We have more ways to play them than ever before, whether it be using original hardware with reproduction carts or flash carts like an EverDrive, modding or hacking your console to play backups or burns, software emulation via emulation station, or hardware emulation via a mister or an analog console. This stuff is accessible in all sorts of different ways. This time around, I won't actually be going into how to actually make these hacks. If you crave that information, check out the first ROM hacking video, which should have most of the info that you're looking for. I should probably mention that most, if not all of these ROM hack patches can be downloaded over at romhacking.net. Although, who knows, you might find some pre-hacked version out there somewhere in the ether of the internet, if you know where to look. All right. Let's dive in with some of the more egregious emissions from the last video that I caught a bit of flack for leaving out. Mega! Sonic the Hedgehog 3 Complete is an extensive improvement hack that goes much further than combining Sonic 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles into a single experience. A number of gameplay options let you tailor the adventure in various ways. Some, as minor as letting the music continue if you die, to as major as the order of the levels. In a world where Sonic Origins exists, this might lose a tiny bit of its appeal, but I'm sure fans would agree that it's still much better in a whole lot of ways too. Yoshi's Island would be a perfect game if it wasn't for that crying baby. You've probably heard that sentiment before. So now you can just slip that person a ROM hack of Yoshi's Island Pacifier Edition, which silences little baby Mario. Hmm, now that it's gone, I sort of miss it. I've always felt like breaking the blocks in the Super Mario All-Stars version of Mario 1 felt wrong. Like Mario just pushes through the blocks instead of rebounding like he should. As it turns out, I wasn't alone. The brick fix patch, try saying that 10 times, makes it feel more like it should. The Castlevania 2 English retranslation plus map hack brings a whole slew of improvements to its constantly criticized shortcomings, creating a much higher tier game in the series. Stuff like a clear translation, opening cinematic, 
seamless day-to-night transitions, and a world map gives a lot more context to where you are in the world. This is a huge game changer. Last but not least, we have the now iconic Mother 3 English translation, which is considered by many to be one of, if not the best fan translation of all time. Part of me wonders if the reason Mother 3 has never gotten an official translation and release is because Nintendo doesn't think they could do it any better. One of the most interesting developments in the ROM hacking scene has come from Vitor Vilela's project Fast ROM, which converts Super NES games from slow ROM to fast ROM. <laughs> this allows games to run the system CPU around 33% faster, eliminating slowdown, and it might even result in other improvements. The thing is, you probably won't notice too many outright differences, which I guess is the point. These hacks might simply just make a game feel more responsive. Other times, the benefits will be very obvious, such as with Faceball 2000. It might not seem like much, but this felt pretty impressive to me in 1992. The fast ROM hack makes it a bit smoother and straight up more playable. Thanks to Kondo Wantu, over 60 Super NES games have been converted to fast ROM, with more to come in the future. Check these out and see if you notice any improvements or differences in some of your favorites. Of course, this doesn't mean the end of SA1 hacks. Although they were pretty new when I did the last ROM hacks video, several other titles have been enhanced with this significant upgrade in the last couple of years, such as Contra 3 and Super R-Type. But none of these games benefited more than Race Driving, the follow-up to one of my favorite guilty pleasures, Hard Driving. The SNES original was notorious for its horrendous frame rate, and the SA1 hack is an absolute game changer graphically. Interestingly, the hacked version also extends the instant replay by several seconds. I'm not sure if this was intentional or just a side effect, but it slows the game down in unanticipated ways. I have to say though, despite the obvious improvements, I personally found it to be much more difficult to play, as if the controls were just too touchy now. In the last video, I'd also gotten my first taste of Game Boy colorizations in the form of Super Mario Land DX. In the years since, we've seen a pretty significant boom in these types of hacks. Some really, really impressive. Others, a little bit less so. Kirby's Dream Land, the one that started it all for the little pink puff, got the DX treatment in 2020, and it looks pretty good. At first, I thought the Kirby's signature pink color was off. It was just way too deep and saturated when I was playing on my mister. Turns out, there's two different versions of this hack one for emulators, and the other one for original hardware. Once I tried the one tailored for emulators, it looked much better. Two of the Game Boy Castlevania games, Castlevania The Adventure and Castlevania II Belmont's Revenge, had colorizations done by Konami themselves for inclusion in the Konami GB collections released in Europe. These hacks can now be applied toward those releases to create full-color standalone versions of each game. I do wish they could have fixed the V-Sync junk with the first game, though. Rounding out the trilogy, we have Super Mario Land 3, Wario Land. While not as elaborate as Taurus' work on the first two games, it's still pretty good, even if the colors do feel a bit muted at times. Most recently, the weird but totally unique fifth Game Boy Mega Man game received an exquisitely done colorization in late 2022 called Mega Man World 5 DX, a play on the Japanese title of the same game. The vibrant colors really make this feel like a brand new game. There's even more colorizations out there, such as Kid Icarus DX and Metroid 2 DX. 
although they don't seem quite as thorough of a conversion. Some of my favorite ROM hacks are those that are so completely inconsequential that you'd never even know that they were there unless you were told about it. I really like the idea that one little thing about a game got stuck in someone's craw enough that they just had to do something about it. The speed up hack for Ashura, aka Rambo First Blood Part 2, aka Secret Command on the Master System, speeds up movement when you move left or right. I can see the appeal, but it felt like it makes the game way more difficult to play. There's one hack for Animaniacs on the Genesis that restores the sound test to the option screen. Kind of makes you wonder why Konami felt the need to remove it in the first place. This one really cracks me up. A hack that changes the color of Link's hair in Zelda 3: A Link to the Past from pink to brown. Now, I get why this was done, but it just looks wrong to me. I don't know, anyone else feel the same? Road Rash 1 and 2 were hacked to save your game to SRAM every time you complete a set of five levels. I never knew I wanted something like this till it existed. In fact, SRAM save improvement hacks continue to be one of my favorite types of hacks. Game Ground on the Genesis has an SRAM hack to save high scores. Mylon's Secret Castle on the NES pulled a Metroid and starts you with a small amount of health every time you continue, and you'd have to grind to refill it every single time. The full health hack starts you, obviously, with full health when you start a new game and every time you continue. This one speaks directly to me. The Super Bomberman No Walk Sounds hack. Footstep sound effects annoy me so much in 2D games for some reason that I can't quite understand it. But this one is annoying on a whole other level. You know, if there's a hack to remove similar effects in other games, then I will happily use it every time. Updated rosters for classic sports games is one of the huge benefits of ROM hacks that probably doesn't get enough credit, especially when such a thing would be paid DLC these days. You'd be hard pressed to find a better hockey game than good old NHL 94. With NHL 94 2023 edition, you get current players, stats, and teams in a classic package. I honestly can't imagine how long this took to do, since it seems to include headshots of some of these players and has the new team logos in there. If we're talking about NHL hockey, check out the wide mode hacks for the different annual entries on the Genesis that increases the game's resolution and opens up the field of view significantly. With this hack, almost the entire horizontal width of the rink can be seen on screen at once. Although it was and continues to be the butt of fifth generation console war jokes, there's some people out there who feel very strongly about Quest 64 being a pretty good game. Maybe it is, I really haven't played it that much. But the meter on those chances increases ever so slightly with the release of the Quest 64 French vanilla hack. Despite its name, <laughs> this isn't a French translation or anything. Instead, it's an overall quality of life enhancement that has loads of changes from damage balancing to enemy item drop frequency, making it way more playable. Especially for those who have a hard time adjusting to 20 plus year old gameplay quirks. Although good intentioned, I never felt that the remake of Metal Gear Solid, the Twin Snakes on the GameCube, came close to the original PS1 classic. The retrofitted gameplay mechanics just broke too much of the level design, but that just scratches the surface. Another slip up was the complete replacement of the soundtrack, giving us something more akin to the feel of Metal Gear Solid 2.
Although not much can be done about the other elements, hacker Afrojack X has done what he could to restore the music from the PS1 classic into the Twin Snakes to great effect. Prolific ROM hacker Infidelity has brought us a slew of incredible overhauls and improvements for years now. The last couple of years, he's been focusing on something a little different, porting the NES games Mega Man 4 and, most recently, Mega Man 2 to the Super NES. The fact that these ports were done essentially entirely by hand in hexadecimal makes it even more impressive. The more powerful hardware enables the expected upgrades, such as reduced, but not completely eliminated sprite flicker. Of course, there's gonna be some unavoidable differences too, such as the sound and music having to be emulated on the SNES hardware, which makes them sound a little bit different. Tweaks, fixes, and updates are being actively worked on, so most of the kinks should be worked out soon enough. An MSU1 version of the Mega Man 4 port is already out there, which incorporates CD music pulled from the arcade fighting games and the PS1 ports. Mega Man 2 should be getting an MSU1 version shortly. Now, it's fan translation time. And let me tell you, we are living in a renaissance of fan translations, localization cleanups, and ports of official translations from one platform to another. It seems like a new big one is being announced every single week, and there's something out there for everyone. In the 90s, you might have read about Tokimeki Memorial in game magazines who would deride it as being a weird dating sim. But here in 2023, we have the guidance of Tim Rogers to tell us about how wrong they all were and how good it actually is over the course of six hours. So while I'd prefer the PS1 or Saturn version, I'll take the fan translation of the Super Famicom version of Tokimeki, I'm sorry, Heartthrob Memorial in the meantime. So cool to finally play this, but can't say I'm a big fan of the font choice here. I'm not sure if this came down to certain resolution limitations, but it's uh, not great. <music> Additionally, on the Konami front, the recently released translation of the Super Famicom version of Parodius is pretty funny. Not that my expectations were sky high or anything like that, but I really got a kick out of the options you can choose from on the continue screen. Meh, let's not. Ted Woolsey's Final Fantasy III script is an absolute classic, if you ask me. But if some of the censoring in that script, no matter how silly it is, bothered you, then Ted Woolsey's Final Fantasy VI Uncensored is exactly what you're looking for. Now I've brought up the Fantasy Star retranslation before in other videos but I haven't had a chance to talk about the 2.0 update that came out in 2020. Here, not only do you get a refined script with additional names, info, and references in there, but you also now have a number of modifiers to streamline the experience, such as having the number of battles, increased walk speed, and multiplying experience and money per battle. A font choice, sound test, and uh, being able to choose whether or not Alice's sprite's hair color matches the cutscenes and the title screen. Sure, the Switch Sega Ages version with the built-in mapping system might make the game more palatable for newcomers, but this is a great way to experience the game on original hardware. Then there's Fantasy Star Generation 4 from Galleon Unlimited. This is a retranslation and a relocalization, and 
Not that the original was bad or anything like that, but one thing that's always bothered me is how names and various other pieces of lore were altered from game to game. This brings a lot of that back in line with previous entries. There is two different flavors of this hack, one for purists, and another one which takes a few working designs-esque liberties with the writing. But for all the goings-on in the world of cartridge game translations, the most exciting stuff has been cropping up on CD and DVD-based consoles. The PlayStation 1 has some goodies you gotta check out. Harmful Park is an absolutely stunning Japanese exclusive side-scrolling shooter with amazing pixel art and a completely nonsensical storyline. If you don't speak the language and want to follow along with the madness, then the fan translation is exactly what you need. Wow, this game is absolutely awesome, but it is so, so expensive. <laughs> Beavis and Butthead in Virtual Stupidity is a scum-styled point-and-click adventure that is far superior to its SNES and Genesis counterparts. In the US, it was released only on the PC, while in Japan, there was a PS1 port. Except, on that version, all the voices were redubbed in Japanese. Freya! 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 Whoa! Now, yeah, this is entertaining in its own right, but if you wanted to play the console version in English, then you were out of luck. That is, until the release of this patch, which takes the English audio and text and puts them in the PS1 game. Now, if you're a fan, which I definitely am, then this is a real treat. <laughs> it's like a jail for air. <laughs> of course, that's not all. Stepping in to help me out on this front is Digital Foundry's John Lineman, who's going to show off some of the big names that have cropped up on the Sega Saturn, where things might even be more interesting and exciting. I love the Sega Saturn, but as anyone familiar with its history knows, it didn't exactly set the sales charts on fire here in the West. In Japan, however, it found a huge following and became the most successful Sega console in that territory. As a result, more than 75% of the system's library remains exclusive to Japan. Given the sheer volume of role-playing games in that mix though, many of its best games are difficult to truly enjoy if you cannot read or understand Japanese. Which is why the Sega Saturn fan translation scene has become so welcome, with many of the system's heavy hitters now fully playable in English thanks to their hard work. One of the most welcome releases has to be the original Grandia. Created by Game Art specifically for the Sega Saturn hardware, Grandia only ever saw release in the West via a graphically inferior PlayStation port, or the more recent HD version, which is also based on the PlayStation port. Thanks to Saturn Wrangler extraordinaire, Trekkies Unite 118 as he's called, the original version is now fully playable in English on the Saturn. The basic idea was to simply adapt the English script that exists on PlayStation, but correct some of the typos, remove unnecessary cuts, and retain the original Japanese voice acting. Saturn Dave from the Shiro podcast was even kind enough to make this for me, a replica of Grandia that resembles what an official US Sega Saturn release might have looked like. It includes the English translation, of course, and it all feels remarkably authentic. He even included a full color manual and a map. Thanks Dave, you rock. But this is really just the beginning. An even more impressive translation effort has to be Hudson's Balk Slash. This fast paced mech action game is an impressive feat of engineering for the old Sega Saturn, but it happens to rely heavily on a mix of Japanese text and voiced lines, making it difficult to enjoy without at least some knowledge of Japanese. I did a whole live stream of this game on Digital Foundry with some of the team members on this project, but basically these guys went above and beyond. The entire game was translated into English and fully dubbed. 
Yeah, they even went through the entire process of re-recording everything in full English, and it is glorious. Seriously, listen to the quality of this voice acting here. Leone Rhodes, Sergeant First Class Reporting. I'm here to help, Chris. But that's not all. They've even added full support for the Sega Saturn Twin Stick, a controller designed for use with Virtual On. If you have one of these bad boys lying around, you can now enjoy Bulk Slash in a whole new way, and it is just fantastic. Now, one of the most popular games on the Sega Saturn in Japan is Sakura Tyson, or Sakura Wars. This high-budget fusion of visual novel, dating sim, and tactical RPG was a tremendous hit, but America just wasn't ready for it back in the 90s, I suppose, so it never got a translation. That is, until Noah Steam and his merry band got together to release a patch allowing you to enjoy the game in English. Now you too can experience the magic of Sakura Wars. The attention to detail here is simply superb. The menus, graphics, and the entire script have all been transformed into something that actually feels like an official product that could have existed, maybe even better than what we might have gotten back in the day. And that same team is already hard at work on Sakura Wars 2. There's a demo available right now even if you're curious to try it, but it's fantastic to see this series getting so much love all these years later either way. Okay, but what about games that did make their way to the West on PlayStation, but also happened to receive Saturn conversions in Japan? Vandal Hearts is a fantastic tactics game from Konami, which happened to receive a Saturn port for some reason, much like Castlevania Symphony of the Night and Suikoden before it. But thankfully, this just happens to be the best port of the three, without the visual scaling issues from Castlevania or the horrendous loading times of Suikoden. Lunar Silver Star Story was remastered for the 32-bit generation from the Mega CD originally, but we only ever received the working designs release on the original PlayStation, so this is fantastic news for Saturn fans. Oh, and how could I not mention Police Knots? This is effectively Hideo Kojima's follow-up to Snatcher, the legendary graphic adventure. As a graphic adventure, however, this one would have been difficult to enjoy if you don't speak the language, but now, like the rest, it's fully playable in English right on your Saturn. Now, these are just some of the highlights, but really, there's a lot more out there too. The Saturn's library is truly phenomenal, and it's great to see so many talented folks working hard to bring these experiences to more people. Whether you have an original Sega Saturn console, or you prefer to use emulation, it's time to play some Sega Saturn. All right, thanks for that, John. I'm excited to finally play that Police Knots translation in the upcoming months. And now, to wrap things up, it's variety time. There's a large number of hacks that I wanted to mention, but because they didn't quite fit into any one category, I figured that I'd just throw them all in together. <laughs> After four years of development, Gabriel Pyron's nearly complete overhaul of the subpar Genesis version of Street Fighter II finally went public during the summer of 2020. And dang, it is absolutely fantastic. The amount of love and work that went into this project is staggeringly apparent, giving us a glimpse of what is possible if you have a clear grasp of the system's capabilities and, more importantly, time. The laundry list of improvements include, most obviously, an all-new life bar HUD, font, more color, and improved portrait and stage graphics. Underneath the surface, some damage values and bug fixes have been implemented as well. Lastly, voice quality has been improved significantly, although it still doesn't come close to the clarity of the Super NES version. You win! Perfect! Another fighting game overhaul is the Arcade Edition hack for the 32X version of Mortal Kombat 2. What originally felt like squandered potential has finally achieved its true form by restoring sound effects, voices, and combos, as well as improving effects and graphical flourishes throughout. 
I also appreciate the option to make the CPU not be as annoying to fight after the third match on the ladder. Finish him. Fatality. Continuing on the 32X, I'd be an idiot if I left out Doom 32X Resurrection, which is absolutely insane. This is a complete overhaul. No, no, wait. A complete engine replacement of Doom on the 32X that makes what was once frustratingly janky in so many ways into a showpiece of the 32X's brute power. Porting the engine used in the Jaguar and 3DO versions, everything has had a massive, massive upgrade. From frame rate, viewing screen size, a redone soundtrack, new graphical assets, control tweaks to let you take advantage of a six button controller, save RAM support. Seriously, I could go on and on here, but the results speak for themselves. I mean, just look at it. It seems crazy that this can even be patched onto the original ROM. Now, if you want a real deep dive on both Doom 32X Resurrection and Mortal Kombat 2 Arcade Edition 32X, then check out Sega Lord X, who has some great videos on those very subjects. Lastly, I would normally leave something like this out, but it was just too good to ignore. I'm talking about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Re-Revenge. <laughs> This hack for Streets of Rage 2 drops in the sprites from Tribute's 2022 brawler, TMNT Shredder's Revenge. Now, on paper, that sounds completely silly, but thanks to how Tribute tends to conform their sprites to a traditional pixel grid, all it took was an extremely talented group of hackers to make this work. And it works exceptionally well. Everyone is here, even Casey Jones. As far as I could tell, they have all their moves, although there are some concessions that needed to be made in order to work within the context of Streets of Rage 2. For instance, there aren't any weapon pickups in Shredder's Revenge, so no animation exists for holding a weapon. In Re-Revenge, if you try to pick up a weapon, then the hack has been programmed to make it so that you'll automatically just drop it on the ground. That makes sense. Initially, this hack felt off to me because the gameplay of a TMNT game didn't quite work with the speed of a typical Streets of Rage game. But once I was advised to jump into the option mode and turn on turbo, then that made a world of difference and everything feels perfectly tuned now. Still, Streets of Rage music didn't quite jive with the feel of a TMNT game. And that is where friend of the show, Show, stepped in and created a MSU MD and MD Plus audio version that injects some much needed Turtles tunes where they belong. The whole thing is so cohesive now and works better than you'd ever expect. Well, I guess that should be enough to keep you occupied for another three years or so. A huge thank you to all of our friends on the My Life in Gaming Discord who suggested a chunk of these hacks. And now, as I said before, there's so many of these out there and all sorts of new ones arriving every day that it's hard to keep up. Feel free to let me know about some of your favorites that I might have missed so that I can earmark them for a future episode. And to everyone who works on these hacks, you are the absolute best. It's your dedication and passion that keeps this scene thriving, and I cannot wait to see what you all have in store for the future. Yeah.